everybody. I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. And today I have my friend Haley on the podcast with us. Hi, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson was a famous football player and actor who was charged with murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ron Goldman. O.J. is probably the most famous person in America to be charged with murder, right? I don't think there's anybody close. Yeah, I don't think so either. I, I think you've got it spot on. So, like, even other people like like Phil Spector, like, it wasn't, like, a media sensation. Like, this was, like, the trial of the, of the century, you know? Right. I mean, technically, he was found not guilty of the murders of Nicole and Ronald, which is pretty crazy. I know. And that's one thing that um, I'm going to do a little bit differently in this episode. I tend to stay pretty, like, I tend to stay pretty neutral, like, uh, as if we don't know anything. Um, with this case, I'm going to go ahead and and say that OJ's the killer. I mean, we're like, like anything else, we're going to go into the evidence and we're going to look at the theories. And there are some theories that I entertain, but it's just like, so let me say this. I read his book if I did it. Mm -hmm. And basically, supposedly the whole book is nonfiction, except for the chapter that is about the murder. I know. And then um, we'll talk about this later. He did this interview where they're asking him about it. And he's like, well, hypothetically, here's how I did it. And here's what I remember, hypothetically. It's insane. <laughs> insane. But anyway, for like for it I I I believe that he did it. Um but we are gonna enter there are like I said, there are some other theories that I'll entertain. Um this is I just I feel like it's more likely that he did it. And I'll explain why later. All right. So um let's start from the beginning of OJ's story. So OJ Simpson is also known as the Juice. He was born Orenthal James Simpson on July 9th, 1947. He was one of the greatest running backs ever. He played for the Buffalo Bills and was the first person to rush for 2000 yards. He was super fast. Like he could run sideways faster than most people can run forwards. In 1985, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he started acting while he was in college, and he appeared in an episode of a drama series called Medical Center while he was negotiating his first contract with the Bills. So he was actually acting before he was playing football. He went on to appear in the Naked Gun films, The Klansmen, Roots, Capricorn One, and then he did his own show called Juice that it was just like Ashton Kutcher's punk <laughs> Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was like after the trial and everything. Like, I, I feel like that was him trying to stay relevant. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It was in like 2006, I believe. Um, he was also famously a spokesman for Hertz Rental Car Company. So OJ was born and raised in San Francisco, California, to his mother, Eunice Durden, who was a hospital administrator. And his father was named Jimmy Lee Simpson, who was a chef and a bank custodian. Jimmy Lee left the family when OJ was only four years old, but he remained present in his son's life. When OJ was a kid, he discovered that his father was a homosexual when he and his friend went to visit him and Jimmy Lee opened the door with another man behind him and both of them were wearing nothing but bathrobes. The friend, his name was Calvin, he was later quoted as saying, back in our day, that was the worst thing in the world that you could ever think about, an African-American man being a homosexual. Another source was quoted as saying, Mama Simpson, as he was known to me, used to hang around the hotel where I lived and was frequently dressed in drag. Everyone knew he was OJ's dad. He got to be known as Mama Simpson because he favored young, butch, white kids as boyfriends. Interesting. Later on, OJ would kind of be, be a little bit of a homophobe. And uh, a lot of people believe this is why, that this was like, um, again, like they said, in that time, being black and gay, it, it, was, uh, it was really shameful. Yeah, and it, it probably really did alter a lot for him, whether it should have or shouldn't have. I'm sure it did. Right, and this was still what um, he was born... He was born in 1947, so this was the 50s and 60s. So this was actually really similar to, like, Marvin Gaye's story. Yes. OJ's maternal grandparents were from Louisiana, and his aunt gave him the name Orenthal, which she said was the name of, of a French actor that she liked. He was called OJ from birth, and he didn't even know that his name was Orenthal until a teacher read it in third grade. That's crazy. I know. They just called him OJ his whole life, and he never wondered what it was. <laughs> OJ actually had rickets as a child, and he wore braces on his legs until he was five, and he ended up being bow-legged because of that, which is really interesting that he's so fucking fast. That is interesting. I had no idea. And like I said, OJ studied at USC, that's the University of Southern California, and that's where he played football and started acting. 
At age 19, he married his first wife. Her name was Marguerite, and they would go on to have three kids together named Arnell, Jason, and a little girl named Erin. Erin actually died at 23 months old. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we'll get to it. Um, it was really sad, and it was, like, right in the midst of their, di- of their divorce. Oh, gosh. So we're going to talk about Nicole real quick. Nicole Brown was born in Germany on May 19, 1959. She was the second of four daughters born to Lou and Judith Brown. Her mom was German and her father was an American who was living in Germany. And the family moved back to South, uh, the, the family moved to Southern California when Nicole was four. As a child, Nicole was known for being really headstrong. Like she was the type of person or the type of child who would fall down and get right back up and just like face her challenges head on. Like there were a couple of child of childhood injuries that her family like always made uh, always like teased her for. And she just like would like get up and dust herself off and like get right back up. So like one time she crashed her back and went like rear over handlebars and she literally just like got back up and went, I'm fine. And like got back on her bike. Oh, that's great. Those are strong spirited women. I know. And then another time she fell off a horse and her head started bleeding and her sister Denise was like freaking out. But ultimately she just like got back on the horse too. (laughs) Oh my goodness. And you know what? Um, just to like foreshadow a little bit, it kind of says a lot about um, having an abusive husband. And later on, people would say things about Nicole, like how she pushed his buttons. And it's like, maybe she just stood up for herself, you know? Yeah, she just didn't back down to him every single time. Nicole's sister, Denise, was two years older, and she was actually known as the pretty one, which is like baffling that like Nicole is not the pretty one anywhere she is, you know? Yeah, I would love to uh, not be the pretty one and be as pretty as Nicole. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine just like, I want to be about these, this family's genetics, you know? Yeah, we need some of those. So Denise worked as a model, and sometimes she would invite Nicole to go on work trips with her. So Nicole ended up deciding to try modeling for herself, and when she graduated high school, she went to New York to work as a model. Introduce O.J. Simpson. <laughs> yeah. Because she didn't work very long as a model before she met him, I believe. No, actually what happened was she turned 18 on May 19th, 1977. And the very next day was the day that she graduated high school. So as soon as she graduated high school, she left her parents' home and she moved to L.A. And just five weeks later, she would meet O.J. Gotcha. Yeah, that's what I thought. So young. So, yeah, she was literally on her own as an adult for five weeks before this man came into her life. Mm Mm-hmm. So 18-year-old Nicole had just moved to L.A., and she got her very first job at a boutique. After two weeks at the boutique, the owner offered her a job as a waitress at a club that he owned called The Daisy. A couple weeks into her new job at The Daisy, O.J. Simpson came in. O.J. was actually still married to his first wife, Marguerite Whiteley, who he had been married to for nearly 10 years at this point. According to O.J., their relationship had been rocky for a while, but I mean, wouldn't he say that? (laughs) Wouldn't, yeah, if you're married and you found some young, hot 18 year old. Yeah. So, according to OJ, just before their 10 year anniversary, Marguerite sat him down and told him, This isn't working, and I'm five months pregnant. So, OJ was shocked and apparently was like, Well, I need to take some time to think about this, so I'm going to go. Oh. And he told her that he was going to go to the mountains for a couple of days to think, to think things through. On his way out of the city, he stopped at a jewelry store and he bought her an anniversary present before deciding to have breakfast at the Daisy, and that's where he spotted Nicole. OJ was just a few weeks shy of his 30th birthday, so he was nearly 30 and Nicole just turned 18. And according to those who were with him that night, OJ took one look at 18-year-old Nicole and said, I'm going to marry her. As his wife's at home five months pregnant and he didn't know He just found out she was pregnant, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. That's about her an anniversary gift, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, And for the record, OJ's wife, Marguerite, said that he was never physically abusive with her. But you know what? That's, that's honestly, it's irrelevant because we've heard 911 calls of Nicole while OJ's beating her, you know? So I don't think we even need to establish if he's ever been abusive any other time, you know? I, I completely agree. Yeah, there was like, what, eight 911 calls? Some crazy amount. And I'll play a couple of them in a little bit. Even though Marguerite said that he was never physically abusive, there were some sources that said that she was known to wear sunglasses indoors. Mm. Um, I found that difficult to verify, but um, people did say that. 
I will say that when asked about why she and OJ split, she said that it was basically his fame. She said that she was a very private person and yet she couldn't walk down the street without her husband getting swarmed. Yeah, that makes sense. And honestly, not that it matters if he was abusive to her or not, but it's not that uncommon for men to like target one specific person or woman to be abusive to, you know, just something that just makes that flip switch. Not that it's the victim's fault in any way. I think you're right. I think there's different types of abusers and the type that OJ is, he's possessive. Yeah. You're his whole world and he's yours. Like he, Nicole would say, he's obsessed with me. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Marguerite would later go on to support OJ in his trial. So when OJ came to the restaurant and he met Nicole, Nicole had actually never heard of him. Because imagine, Nicole is just an 18-year-old. She has she doesn't know football, you know? Yeah. So he was instantly, like, charming her. And um, she asked her friend, like, who is he again? And she, her friend told her, like, you know, he's a Hall of Fame football player. And she ended up agreeing to go out with him. After their first date, she came home around two in the morning and she had a male roommate. His name was David. And he asked her how her date went. And she was like, oh, my God, it was great. But then he noticed that the zipper of her jeans were torn. It was like torn off of the seam. And he was like, oh, my God, what happened? And Nicole was like, he ripped my pants off. But I really like him. This was the first date. Oh, boy. I mean, I can see how that could go one of two ways. Like there could be a way to enjoy it. But given the context, we know. I don't know about that. And it's it's a lot to rip somebody's clothes on the first day. And she's 18. I mean, to me, it's, it's just, it's a big age difference. Like, she just turned 18, you know? Like, yeah, so young here. So, And this guy is a six-foot-tall running back, you know? I don't know. Yeah, I don't like that. Anyway, within the first couple of dates, OJ told Nicole that he didn't like her living with a male roommate. So he got her a place of her own. He paid for it and everything. And as a result, she becomes financially dependent on him pretty quickly, and she stopped working because she didn't really need to. This effectively meant that her life as an independent adult only lasted a couple of months. No, oh, no. By July 1977, OJ went to Buffalo, New York to train with the Buffalo Bills, and then he went back to L.A. briefly for the birth of his daughter, Erin, whose mother he's still married to. Mm-hmm. And she didn't say it, but I bet that's another reason she divorced him was because he's already dating another girl, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think that's a pretty good reason. I don't know why she didn't just say that. Why'd you guys split up? Uh, have you met Nicole? <laughs> yeah, well, she like defended him forever. So I don't know, some kind of loyalty. For real. After OG went back to Buffalo, Nicole flew out there with her sister Denise to watch him play in a football game. And Nicole and Denise sat with a friend of theirs and OJ's named Mike Patello. When OJ ran out onto the field, he looked up at Nicole like he found her in the whole crowd and he winked at her and he just made her feel like the most special thing ever. And Mike was even like every time he scored a touchdown, Mike was even like, oh, he scored that for you. And Nicole's just beaming. Yeah, who wouldn't be? They both looked like they were absolutely in love with each other. But then at the end of the game, Nicole thanked Mike for the great evening, and she gave him a kiss on the cheek. Right at that moment, OJ was trying to show his teammate who his girlfriend was, and he pointed up at her and saw Nicole kissing Mike on the cheek. So when they got home, OJ went ballistic, and he screamed at her, how could you embarrass me like that? So later that evening, Nicole was telling Denise, why does he treat me like this? But then they ended up going to a party that night and they had a great time. Nicole just wrote off the incident and they moved on like it never happened. Yeah, it's so easy to write it off as he does this because he loves me so much. And the thing is, OJ was a huge charmer. Yeah. He was charming. And, and we have to remember that about actors that sometimes they're not just charismatic, but they're literally trained and they know how to they know how to captivate an audience, you know? Mm hmm. Without a doubt. So I, I fully believe that that's what he did. He he would love bomb her afterwards. And mm -hmm. we'll have some examples of that. OJ began abusing Nicole pretty much right away. Eventually, it was found that Nicole had actually been keeping a safety deposit box where she kept diary entries and was like documenting evidence of the abuse. Those close to her believe that Nicole might have been documenting the abuse because she knew deep down that he might kill her one day. On Nicole's 19th birthday, so like not even a year after they get back together, OJ punched Nicole in the face and left her with a big black eye. And to apologize, he bought her a brand new Porsche with a giant bow on it. She said that she felt like an idiot driving around Beverly Hills in a Porsche with a black eye. 
Yeah. And can you imagine being hit in the face at 19 by a football, like a professional football player? I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I, that's terrifying. That is terrifying. Mm hmm. So when this happened, Nicole actually went to stay at her parents' house, and they actually didn't know that Nicole was dating O.J. Simpson until the Porsche showed up with, like, at their house with O.J. Simpson driving it. And here's what's funny. Apparently, Nicole's father was a little bit racist. According to Nicole's sister, Denise, she said, I think my father's reaction was, well, I guess if it's going to be a black guy, I'm glad it's someone who's not a bum. I know he thought that because that's how he thinks. Well, that's kind of gross. <laughs> this is really interesting to me about this case because it says a lot about how a lot of people viewed O.J. Simpson. Yeah. One of the podcasts I listened to, it's called You're Wrong About, and they made a really good point about this. What they said was that people will put aside their negative prejudice of black people if that black person can suit their positive prejudice of rich people. Yeah, that's so true. And we see that all the time without even really noticing it. And, and this becomes so true with how the police treat O.J. Simpson better than they've ever treated a person of color in history. For sure. And another thing is, so by the time Nicole gets murdered, that was like two or three years after the Rodney King beatings, you know? So, like, it didn't make sense. No. We'll go more into the details of that later. So O.J. would lose his temper often, but those around him didn't really acknowledge that his behavior was abuse. They talked about it like he was just blowing off steam, and even Nicole's family made jokes about, like, how when they argued, O.J. would grab Nicole's family pictures and throw them down the stairs or out the window, and Nicole would always pick them back up and reframe them and put them back where they were, no matter how many times he smashed them. And her mom was just like, why do you keep replacing them? And she's just like, I'm not, I'm not going to let him do that. Like, and she would always put it back, and her mom would start making jokes like, oh, is my picture out on the front lawn again? Wow. Some people also said that Nicole instigated disputes with OJ, saying, with OJ saying things like that she knew how to push his buttons. Um, like I read some accounts from their mutual friends saying that OJ never said a bad word about Nicole, but Nicole was constantly talking badly about OJ. And when people say that she gave him a hard time, again, that probably means that she gave him shit about him cheating on her. Yeah, and when you've been abused since the beginning, uh, yeah, you start to not like somebody. And of course, the abuser is not going to be putting on their real true self in front of others. Yeah, it's exactly that kind of thing how like men can, you know, express themselves any way they want. But as soon as a woman stands up for herself, she's emotional mm -hmm. or hysterical. Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact that he was beating her, he also started cheating on Nicole pretty early on. One day during OJ's season with the 49ers, Nicole showed up unexpectedly at her parents' house after fighting with him again about his infidelities. She drove eight hours from San Francisco to Laguna, and when she got there, she told her mom that he was an asshole and she was never going back. And her mom, of course, figured she, that she was going to spend the night, but she took a phone call from OJ, and suddenly she was like, I've got to go back. And she was out the door, and she drove back another eight hours. No. Well, it turned out that during the phone call, OJ actually said to her, if you don't get back up here, I'm going to get another girlfriend and fuck the shit out of her. Oh, gosh. It's so sad. It is sad. And probably if it had been different circumstances and a different boyfriend, she would have been like, peace out, Girl Scout. But it's just the cycle. Yeah. And, and also at 18, how many serious relationships have you had? You know, like how much do you really know? Yeah, probably not a lot. Even if you have. it's Right. Yeah. So they continued their relationship into 1979. One day, OJ was at practice while Nicole was hanging out with friends at home, and the phone rang. It was AC. AC is Al Cowlings, who was OJ's good friend. They were teammates in high school, college, and in the NFL. AC is also well known for having driven OJ in the famous police chase in the White Bronco. So AJ was calling up their home. Um, oh, I don't know what I said. So AC was calling them up at home, and OJ wasn't home. He was, like, out training. So Nicole picks up the phone, and AC tells him that he's in a hospital in Santa Monica, and he has terrible news, and here's a trigger warning. This is about the baby. So OJ and Marguerite's 23-year-old daughter, Erin, had fallen into the family pool and was in a coma. 23 months, right? Three months. She was just a month short of her second birthday. Oh my gosh. So apparently what happened was 
so they had three kids. Remember, Aaron was the youngest, and then Jason and Arnell were older. They were like nine and 11 years old at this point. Those two were like out front, like washing their car, washing their parents' car. And Marguerite was actually paying the babysitter. And at that moment, I guess Aaron opened the side door and like went straight for the pool and went in. And apparently they got her out right away and everything, but the baby fell into a coma. According to a friend of Marguerite's, OJ showed up at the hospital and accused Marguerite of having been negligent and started shouting at her down the hospital halls, you murdered my baby. Oh my gosh. My son is two years old and he does the same thing straight to the pool every single time if if there's that. So I can totally see how that happens and it's terrifying and it's, that's very sad. Oh my God. That is my biggest nightmare. Mm -hmm. And, and again, they're still married at this point. They're just, they've been separated for about a year. Like he's been dating uh, Nicole for about a year at this point. Mm -hmm. Shortly after this incident, OJ and Marguerite finally officially signed a separation agreement. Marguerite was granted full custody of their two kids, Arnell and Jason, and she tried to get the Rockingham home and the divorce, but OJ would not give it up. Even though it meant that his kids would be uprooted. Like, absolutely not. The three of you can find somewhere else to live. Yeah, I'm sure his attitude was very, this is all mine, mine, mine. So the court ended up letting her stay in the house for a while, but eventually he was able to take possession of the home again. And he actually, like, showed up while she was living there and changed the locks. So, yeah, she was unable to, like, fight fight it any longer. She had to get out of the house. Like, legally, the court was like, I mean, it's OJ's. So OJ and Nicole ended up moving into the Rockingham home, and this house now became the place where friends and family came over for holidays and big events and they had parties all the time. AC was known to always be around. He was like almost like an uncle or a godfather to the kids. He also became really close to Nicole and he was even protective of her. Like if AC was present when OJ and Nicole got into fights, he would always take Nicole's side and tell OJ to stop. Interesting. AC actually dated Denise, Nicole's sister, so it seems like um, maybe he kind of got close to their family during that time. Yeah, for sure. Over the years, OJ grew increasingly abusive. Nicole had documented in her diary that he once beat her with a wine bottle and broke her ribs. Mm. He would often apologize with lavish gifts like the Porsche. He also gave her a Ferrari once after a fight. After another fight, he apologized by proposing to her. Can you imagine? No, I mean, honestly, the sad thing is, yes, I can imagine because we hear about it so often, but thank God I can't relate at all. Yeah, truly. According to Kris Jenner, Nicole had really fallen by OJ by then. She had said the two of them were madly in love and had this obvious chemistry that you could feel whenever you were in the same room with them. They absolutely could not keep their hands off each other. He was already incredibly possessive of Nicole. Even when she would go to the bathroom, OJ would wonder out loud when she was going to come back. Like, he would say out loud to his friends, like, when is she coming back? That's crazy. I don't know how their friends weren't, like, how red flags weren't screaming at them. I know, but I can kind of see how people could think that's endearing. Like, you know, you're at a party, you know, everything's going on. When's my my babe coming back? Like, oh. everything he did off of as like that's just his personality as if he's just like an impulsive guy you know yeah yeah and hindsight is twenty twenty. nicole and oj married on february 2nd 1985 in the backyard of the rockingham estate nicole didn't really tell anybody about the abuse she was experiencing but she did talk to her friends about him cheating on her and she really thought that once they got married he would stop cheating mm. by this point nicole was already pregnant with their first child that would be their daughter sydney During this pregnancy, OJ became really fixated on her weight. He expected her only to gain the weight of the baby and no more. And and not just that, he believed that it should be no more than seven pounds. Oh my goodness. Small baby she was allowed to gain. Yeah, never mind that the placenta weighs like what, five pounds itself? Oh my God. Nicole became pregnant with their son Justin in 1988. And during these pregnancies... OJ was not only sleeping with random women, but he was also having a long-term affair with an actress and model named Tawny Katane. And this was pretty, this was pretty well known. Um, At one point, Nicole actually found a bracelet that she thought was going to be a gift for her. And then she later saw Tawny Katane wearing it. That's scandalous and heartbreaking. (sighs) I know. It must have broken her heart. Yeah. 
Nicole started refusing to have sex with OJ at one point because he never wore a condom with anybody and he refused to get tested. So she was legitimately worried about getting an STD. And I feel like that's fair. Yeah, for sure. Ugh. Around fall or winter of 1985, just a few months after their wedding, Nicole drove home from lunch and OJ began attacking her car with a baseball bat. Like she parked her car and he just started beating it and she had no idea what was happening. So she was terrified. She got out of her car and ran into the house and she called 911. The officer who showed up was named Mark Furman and he's uh, going to come up again later. OJ was able to convince Furman that this was just a marital spat and he was really just taking a bat to his own car. He was like, that's my wife. This is my car. I should be able to destroy it. And the police were like, well, that's fair. Yeah, sure, dude. Cool. Every time the police are called to Nicole and OJ's home, OJ convinces them that it's just the husband and wife discussion and they have it under control. Like, it doesn't seem like they ever asked Nicole what she wanted or needed. Mm -hmm. And they were also kind of starstruck. Like, for a lot of people, OJ was a sports hero and all the police, like, try to be friendly with him. Like, they were kind of gushing over him. Yeah. It's so weird how, like, for men being a sports hero it's like this guy rushed 2,000 yards and that's important you know Mm -hmm. thank goodness he did that a hero you know yeah for sure and like I said Mark Berman will come up again later in the story um he was pretty racist and he would later be accused of framing OJ Simpson out of out of anger about like a white woman being with a black man hmm In 1988, Nicole and OJ went on vacation in Hawaii with a couple of friends. There were a couple of guys sitting at a nearby table who were seemingly homosexual. (laughs) Like I said, OJ had a big problem with homosexual people. But Nicole was the type who was super friendly, and she started chatting them up. And she's holding her son, little baby Justin. At some point while they're chatting, one of the guys being friendly gave baby Justin a kiss on the forehead. And this made OJ livid. It led to a big argument and and he beat the shit out of her. Oh, God. In fact, I think I have like a picture of her diary entry where she writes about this. I'll upload it on the website. Shortly after returning from Hawaii, Nicole and OJ went out on New Year's Eve with their friend Marcus Allen. Marcus Allen was a football player who was OJ's prodigy. Apparently, Marcus flirted with Nicole a lot and she always shot it down, but... Her friends say that she told them that she actually really liked him. Mm. Either way, nothing ever happened. It's just like he flirted with her and she might have enjoyed it. Yeah, she's probably terrified to even look his way too long. Right. So they all went to dinner and when they got home, they got into a big fight. OJ told his friends later that they had been drinking and Nicole was upset because uh, she found the bracelet that was for Tani Katane. But apparently they started fooling around. And when it came time for Nicole to give him oral sex, she said no. And OJ became upset. This is in OJ's words, by the way. They started arguing about her refusing to have sex. And what follows is what OJ calls a mutual wrestling situation. Oh, my gosh. According to Nicole, he beat her and punched her in the head. Yeah, this 20-year-old woman is willingly wrestling with them. Oh, wow, that is insane to even say. I think it's so funny that these are his words, that he's like, yeah, she wouldn't give me oral sex, so we fucking wrestled. (laughs) Yeah, whoever won had to do good oral sex. (laughs) That's regular. We all do that. (laughs) Like I said, this was on New Year's Eve, so about a quarter after 3 a.m., now New Year's, Nicole calls 911. All that can be heard on the call is a woman screaming and being hit. That's all you can hear. Around 3.30 a.m., two police officers showed up at their home. The housekeeper answered through, like, like the intercom, and she told them that everything was fine and they were not needed. And the police were like, well, no, we need to speak to the person who called. And the housekeeper, again, is like, no, no, really, we don't need you. So the officer's like, listen, I'm not going to go. I really need to talk to the woman who made the call. As the officer is arguing with the housekeeper, Nicole comes running out of some bushes wearing only a bra and sweatpants, and she had mud down the side of her leg. She was clearly injured, like she had, she was covered in cuts and bruises, and she had a handprint on her neck. Oh my gosh. She ran across the driveway to a post with a button to open the gate, and 
there at the post, she collapsed while pushing the button. She was yelling, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And as the gate opened, she ran into the officer's arms, repeating, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And the officer asked, who's going to kill me? <laughs> who's going to kill you? And she said, OJ. So the officer was like, OJ Simpson, the football player, which must be so frustrating. Yeah, seriously. Like, oh, OJ Simpson? <laughs> Where? And I hope she fired their housekeeper. I don't think it was up to her, you know? Yeah, I guess she was probably scared too, but jeez. So Nicole told the officer that her husband, OJ Simpson, had beat her up, hit her with open and closed fists, kicked her, and pulled her hair. He also yelled, I'll kill you. Mm. Nicole told him, you never do anything about him. You talk to him and then leave. I want him arrested. I want him out so I can get my kids. Around this time, OJ comes out saying, I don't want that woman sleeping in my bed anymore. I got two women and I don't want that woman in my bed anymore. Gross. The police tell him that Nicole wants him arrested and he tells them that he did not beat her up. He even says, he tells the police, he says this, the police have been here eight times before and now you're going to arrest me for this? This is a family matter. Why do you want to make a big deal out of this? We can handle it. Wow. I just want to cry for her, you know? I know. And like, how? How have the police been there eight times and they're still not arresting him? I know. They're not doing anything. They can't even put a cop car outside. Yeah. So the police allowed him to go inside and get dressed and he fled. By now, Nicole had filled out a report and she had her injuries photographed, which is way more than the police had ever done before. Nicole also had her sister Denise take photos of her injury so that they could show them to her father. And apparently her father believed that she could still make it work with OJ. Of course he did. And this brings up for me a lot of questions about her household and like if her parents allowed that kind of behavior and like maybe that's why she has having such a hard time leaving not mm -hmm. that it's easy but right i'm sure at that time too they were very well you got married so you already did it you're stuck yeah so nicole started confiding in a guy named ron ship ron ship was a friend of oj's and he was an lapd officer who he actually gave classes about domestic violence he like uh, gave trainings on this Unfortunately, even though all of OJ's friends loved Nicole, they were all kind of under his spell. And I think they truly didn't think that OJ wanted to hurt her. Of course, they didn't think he was going to kill her. So anyway, she told Ron that she had photographs of the injuries and she was considering taking them and making them public. But she kind of still wanted things to work out and she was afraid of leaving OJ. And she also didn't want him to lose any of his endorsements. In fact, when all this happened, like, this got a lot of media attention and she ended up calling the people at Hertz rent a car and told them that this really wasn't a big deal. And she really wishes that they wouldn't take his endorsement away. And of course they didn't want to, you know, they wanted to believe that he was all innocent in this. Yeah, of course. Since OJ had such a great relationship with the LAPD, he got away with only having to serve 120 hours of community service and paying a $479 fine. They could have at least got a little more money out of him. Yeah, at least we got some money out of him. But this community service he did was like public appearances. Yeah, of course. That's what I'm saying. Like the, if it was nothing, at least get like $4,000 for the city. Come on. I know $479 is probably nothing for him. Yeah, exactly. He probably spends that on breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> After this incident, Nicole started making real plans to leave OJ. He didn't take it very seriously, and he told people that this was just a phase. Like, she was going to come back around, and, like, she could go do her thing, but, like, she wasn't going to sleep with anybody. Like, that's not going to happen. Nicole had previously signed a prenup that took seven to nine months to iron out, and the couple ended up divorcing in 1992. Nicole received child support, but, again, OJ kept most of the assets. Um, Nicole did get one little condo that she was able to sell later on. Again, he insisted on keeping the main house, even though that meant that her and the kids would have to leave. Mm -hmm. Initially, OJ was in total denial of their split. He would call Nicole 10 to 15 times a day and would even go as far as to sit in the bushes to stalk and see what she was doing. That's insane. And these poor kids, too, are seeing their dad's behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And on multiple 911 calls, Nicole is heard saying, like, you have to stop screaming, the kids are asleep. Or the kids are upstairs, and you have to wonder, like, if 
they had woken up at all. I'm sure they did. So um, Nicole was trying to move on, and she started spending more time with her friends, and she met a guy named Kato Kalin, who she would invite to come live in her guest house at a reduced rent in exchange for helping take care of the kids. It's also possible that having a male presence made her feel safer. Mm -hmm. Especially with fucking OJ out literally hiding in the bushes. Yeah. Ugh. Cato was an actor, and he was about 35 at the start of the trial. He was also a comedy waiter. Like, like he told jokes while he waited tables in restaurants. That's cool. That's like a thing that people do in L.A., I guess. Like a shtick that restaurants have. That's really cool. It is kind of funny. Like, everybody's trying to be an actor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he kind of became a celebrity because of his relation to this case. Interesting. Yeah, it's dumb. Um, he was like a really goofy guy, uh, but he was really fit and handsome. He's just like the stereotypical, like white blonde guy who's just like trying to be an actor. Like, I, I don't know. He's just this California dude, didn't know much. He was just kind of wrong place at the wrong time, ended up in the middle of OJ and Nicole's relationship. Mm -hmm. Nicole and OJ's kids loved Kato so much that they ended up naming their dog Kato. Oh. Kato said that this would get really confusing. They'd be like, Kato! And he'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah they could have thought that one out a little better <laughs> I know so when Nicole and the kids moved out she decided to move into a house in Brentwood which didn't have a separate guest house for Cato so OJ told Cato that it wouldn't be appropriate for him to keep living in the same house as Nicole so OJ offered to let Cato live with him at the Rockingham home for free super generous right mm-hmm and Nicole never talked to Cato again. Like, she tried to tell him, he's manipulating you. Like, yeah, don't do it. Totally saw this as Cato walking out on her. Yeah. I think it was probably really frustrating for Nicole to constantly see OJ charm his way through things. I can't even imagine how frustrating that would have been. And, like, weasel his way into everybody's life that she had. That's crazy. Yeah, this guy wasn't doing anything except making her feel safer, you know? Mm-hmm. Nicole had a hard time cutting off OJ altogether. She didn't want to hurt his feelings, and I'm sure she, she was kind of afraid of him escalating. She was able to distance herself and live on her own for about a year before she started telling her friends how she missed her home. And then she and OJ began to reconcile in the early spring of 1993. By now, OJ already had another girlfriend named Paula Barbieri, and there was actually a point in time where Nicole was the one calling OJ, and he was ignoring her. Oh, no. She even made copies of their wedding video and, like, sent it to him to try to remind him of their good times. Mm. In April 1993, Nicole showed up at his Rockingham home, and she told him that she wanted to get back together. So they reconciled and they remained together on and off for the next year. Um, it seemed like there was still some hesitance, but they they weren't not together. Yeah. OJ kind of leaves his other girlfriend, Paula, hanging, but he would call her up whenever things got hard with Nicole. It kind of would be hard, like, with from Nicole's perspective to have this guy who was, like, so obsessed that you were constantly calling the police and he was hiding in bushes. And then all of a sudden it quiets down and he has a new girlfriend and you don't have your big, beautiful house anymore. And it's only quieted down because he's probably being impulsive and, and fucking creepy with Paula. Like, it seems like he has to make you his whole world and him your whole, whole world, you know? Yeah, for sure. On October 25th, 1993, Nicole called 911 again. This is the call that you can hear on, like, all the documentaries about this case. Um, do you want to hear it? Yeah. 911 emergency. Can you get again. someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back. Please. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. <laughs> he just <laughs> drove up. Over. Okay, wait a minute. What kind of car is he in? He's in a white Bronco. But first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. Before. Okay, wait a minute. What's your name? Nicole Simpson. Okay, is he the sportscaster or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Thank what is, you. Wait a minute. We're sending the police. What is he doing? Is he threatening you? I'm going nuts. Okay. Has he threatened you in any way, or or is he just harassing you? You're gonna hear him in a minute. He's about to come in again. 
Okay, just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. You're going to beat the shit. Wait a minute, wait. Just stay on the line so we can know what's going on until the police get there, okay? Okay, Nicole? Uh-huh. Just a moment. Does he have any weapons? I don't know. Okay. He went home and now he's back. Okay. The kids are upstairs sleeping and I don't want anything to happen. Okay. Has he hit you today or no? No. Okay, you don't need any paramedics or anything? Uh-uh. Okay. You just want him to Close leave? my door. He broke the whole back door in. She says the kids are up there sleeping and I don't want anything to happen. OJ is actually in the background saying... He's kind of, it's almost like he's saying it to the 911 operator. He's in the background saying, why does it matter if the kids are asleep if she once gave a blow job to a guy named Keith while the kids were sleeping upstairs? Oh, God. He knows this happened because he was spying on her. Oh, my God. What does he say? Just stay on the line, okay? Is he upset with something that you did? Oh, a long time ago, it always comes back. And you can tell by the sound in her voice that she knows this 911 call is going to go nowhere. Like, you can tell that she's done this so many times, and it's never it's never resulted with him going to jail. It almost hurts the more they ask questions like, well, did he hit you? And she's like, no. But she knows he will. Yeah, but he's going to, and he's going to kill me. That's why I'm calling you. Yeah, and she's like, well, did he threaten you? And she's just like, he threatens me all the fucking time, you know? Mm -hmm. Like... It probably, mm -hmm. like, literally, the more they ask her questions, she feels more and more defeated, like. Yeah, and that's exactly how this call sounds. Yeah, like, they're asking questions not to help her and find out information, but rather, like, shoot her down and make sure she's not overreacting, mm -hmm. you know? Yep, exactly. Oddly enough, Kato Kalin, like, showed up during this altercation, like, during the 911 call. And at first, he tried to stay out of it, and, like, he just went to his guest house and was, like, about to go inside but he decided to turn back at the last minute and make sure that no that Nicole was okay. And when he looked, he saw that OJ was still fully raging. Like he was fully attacked. So he was screaming at her and just getting closer to her. And Cato was like, I can't just do nothing. So he kind of starts walking up to them. And as soon as OJ sees them approaching, he like tried to flip a switch and act like he was the victim. So Cato stayed until the police showed up, and he noticed that the police were pretty friendly with OJ. One of the officers at some point said to OJ, yeah, I'm married too. I know what you mean. Gross. Another officer asked Cato if he could fix the door that OJ broke down. Wow. They probably, like, fight at the precinct or whatever about who gets to go out to the OJ call tonight. I bet you're right. Yeah. And I bet they feel all giddy when they, they're, like, all buddy with him, you know? And they yeah. come back, they're like, hey, again. You know? Hey, OJ, these damn women, huh? Ugh. Gross. In April 1994, OJ and Nicole went on vacation with some friends in Cabo. The couple was all mushy and all over each other. And Nicole told her friend, Faye Resnick, that she thinks this is it. She thinks that they're back together for good. The next night, OJ screwed it all up by openly flirting with another woman right in front of all of them. Nicole stayed silent. Like, it was like she was blocking it out. The next day, the whole group of friends went snorkeling and they were hanging out. And OJ told everybody, all their friends, about how Nicole had this huge fear of frogs. Now, most of their friends knew that this was a phobia for Nicole and it wasn't something to tease her about. But OJ was telling him about it like it was fucking hilarious. Like, he was talking about how ironic it was that his wife's biggest fear was frogs, and he was getting ready to star in a series called Frogmen. So then he looks at Nicole and he says, hey baby, I'm the Frogman. Now what do you think about that? Gross. Then as he walked away, she turned to her friend Faye and said, I don't think that's funny. He finds this to be funny. This is not funny at all. It's cruel. 
I'm afraid this man will kill me someday. That just goes to show how, like, your gut just knows, too. Like, she knew from the freaking jump what how her story was going to end. I agree, because I, it's interesting. She wasn't only keeping a diary of the abuse. She was keeping it in a safe deposit box, you know? Mm-hmm. She was keeping it super safe. And and she was also including, like, pictures in it and stuff. Like, pictures of, the pictures of the abuse. Yeah. Like, sh- this woman believed there was a serious threat to her to her life. Mm-hmm. The next day, OJ flew to Puerto Rico for filming, and Nicole told Faye, that's it. I can't do it. I can't be with OJ. Seriously, it's over. I feel that if we get back together, he'll end up killing me. I don't think he's changed. After returning from Cabo, Nicole seemed to be finished with OJ. On May 8th, she updated her will, and on May 14th, they had their daughter Sydney's first communion, which OJ didn't attend. Nicole was, like, really hurt by that. Like, that wasn't important enough for him to show up to. Yeah, I would be, too. But then, on the week of Nicole's birthday, which was May 19th, she got pneumonia, and OJ decided to charm Nicole by stepping up as a parent and taking his kids to and from school. Which seems like a lot when you don't do shit. Mm Mm-hmm. Whoa, good job, OJ. We're all very proud. Yeah, so, and then he, like, brought Nicole her favorite candy and stuff. And Nicole, like, let him. But then on May 22nd, after she started feeling better, she broke things off with him. And she even gave him back a bracelet that he had given her. And she told her friends that she told him she couldn't be bought. Now, OJ tries to reconcile things with his other girlfriend, Paula. In early June, Nicole told a few people that a key to her house was missing from her keychain and she was worried that OJ had taken it. On June 5th, Nicole called up her friend, Jean McKenna. Jean was a realtor and Nicole told her, basically, OJ threatened to report me to the IRS. Um, What happened was she had a condo that was like the one that was left to her in the divorce and she sold it and she bought her own apartment in Brentwood with her own money. The problem was that she reported the Rockingham house as her primary residence, and it wasn't her primary residence anymore. So this would mean that if OJ turned her in, she would have to pay the IRS $90,000, which is all the money she has. So he would have just, like, Mm -hmm. bankrupt her and the kids, you know? Yeah, of course. On June 7th, Nicole called Sojourn House, which was a shelter for battered women in Los Angeles. She told them that her ex-husband had been stalking her and threatening to kill her. See, this is what it's like. Did OJ kill her? Well, there's a lot of fucking documented evidence of him getting really close to killing her, you know? Exactly. Like, way more than any other case that I can think of. And her trying so hard to leave, you know? Like, she's calling the shelter, even though, like, he's not living with her anymore, and she's still terrified of him, you know? Yeah. On June 10th, Nicole and Jean drove around the neighborhood that was near OJ's house to see if they could find any homes. I'm thinking this is her way of, like, selling her apartment and trying to fix this IRS situation. Yeah. So she tried to find homes near OJ because, like, you know, for the kids to be near their father. But she couldn't find anything, like, that was affordable for her. So they ended up going to look in Malibu, and she found something that was perfect. It was within her price range, and she liked it, and she could actually see herself moving on. On June 12th, Nicole and OJ's daughter had a dance recital. OJ got there late, and he didn't sit with the rest of the family. According to Faye Resnick, Nicole said to OJ, fuck off, get away from us, get out of my life. You're not welcome with this family anymore. Reasonable. And she had her whole family with her. I feel like maybe um, she's finally feeling stronger. She's got some support behind her and stuff. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, OJ tried to get Nicole and the Browns, like her family, to pose for a family picture in the parking lot. And of course, that didn't work out. The Browns decided to go out to dinner and OJ asked if he could join. But Nicole was like, no, you can't. And I can't imagine that made him happy. No, I'm sure it did not. Especially, like, he thought he had the Browns in a bag at this point. Yeah, he probably doesn't understand when his charm doesn't work, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. At dinner, there's a waiter named Ron Goldman, who Nicole kind of knows. She mostly know him because they have friends in common, um, but they, they don't really know each other. There's been a lot of speculation about whether Ron and Nicole were romantically involved. And I think that's because one of the biggest theories is that OJ killed her because she was sleeping with Ron, or at least because he thought she was sleeping with Ron. Right. From what I gather, I don't think Nicole and Ron were involved at all. Nicole's friend Faye says that Nicole had a crush on Ron, but 
it doesn't seem like anything ever actually happened to them. In fact, I've even heard some people sit, speculate that Ron might be gay. Mm. Anyway, Nicole saw him at the restaurant and she said hi. When dinner was over, Nicole said goodbye to her family and she took the kids to get ice cream on the way home. And then she put them to bed. Around like 9.30 p.m., OJ actually went to McDonald's with Kato Kalen. And it was like super random. Like they just like picked up their burgers and OJ ate his on the way home, but Kato didn't. And like that was like they just took a trip to McDonald's and go back. And some people wonder if this was OJ trying to build an alibi. Mm, interesting. Um, so this was at about 9.30 p.m. Like I said, once Nicole and the kids got home, she put the kids to bed and then she talked on the phone to her friend Faye. Then after that, she got a call from her mom and her mom told her that she left her glasses at the restaurant. So she asked Nicole if she could like go to the restaurant the next day and pick them up for her. But Nicole's house wasn't far from the restaurant. So she called up the restaurant and asked if she could talk to Ron Goldman. And she was like, hey, when you get off work, could you like swing by and bring me those glasses? And he was like, yeah, like I'm about to get off work. So around 10 p.m., Ron went home, changed his clothes, and then headed to Nicole's house with the glasses. Now, sometime between 10.15 and 10.30, Nicole's dog, Cato, started making a loud noise. Like, he was barking, but also, like, moaning or, like, wailing. Like, somebody said it, it sounded like a wail. Just a couple of hours later, at 12.10 a.m., Nicole and Ron's mutilated bodies were found in front of Nicole's townhouse. They were attacked outdoors in front of Nicole's house. Interestingly, nobody reported hearing any screaming. And remember, the two kids were actually upstairs sleeping this whole time while this was happening right in front of their house. Mm -hmm. And, and I, again, we have to wonder if they're just used to hearing this. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's believed that Nicole either heard a noise outside or she heard a knock at the door. So she came and opened the front door, and that's when she was attacked by O.J., who immediately silenced her. Nicole was stabbed 27 times in the head and neck. She also had defensive wounds on her hands. I'm unclear if Ron attacked during the attack or if he was already at Nicole's house when OJ got there. Ron Goldman actually had a black belt in karate, but again, OJ was a six foot tall Hall of Fame football player. So the struggle was supposedly epic like absolutely brutal but ultimately ron was not able to overpower oj it's believed that oj stabbed ron in the neck and chest before returning to nicole grabbing her by the back of her hair and putting his foot in her back while pulling her hair and then slitting her throat from the left to the right oh my gosh the wound was big enough to expose her larynx mm -hmm. nicole's dog kato was freaking out we know that the neighbors heard him barking and wailing, and then some other neighbors found him wandering around in the streets. This is actually how, like, thanks to this dog, Nicole was found. Yeah, which is so wild. So, like, they found the dog wandering, and one neighbor planned to take him in and take care of him for the night. But Cato literally pulled the guy to Nicole's house, and that's when they, like, happened upon a river of blood. And once they looked a little further, they saw that there were dead bodies on the ground. Hopefully somebody gave the doggo some treats. I know. <laughs> Poor thing. And just, like, the fact that the dog is, like, wailing, it, like, breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. It was an Akita, by the way. <laughs> I know. So sweet. <laughs> the police were called to Nicole's home, and Officer Mark Furman shows up because he's familiar with the place. Yeah, of course. So then they go to OJ's house at, like, 4.30 in the morning to inform him that the mother of his children is, has been murdered, but OJ is not there. Instead, they find Cato Kalin, who says that OJ is in Chicago. He also said that he heard loud bangs outside of his guest house around 10.40 p.m. The police reportedly walked around the area outside of the guest house, and that's where they found a glove covered in blood. They also found blood on OJ's white Bronco, and there was a trail of blood from the Bronco to the front door. Now, the gloves are important because there was the one glove that was found at OJ's house covered in blood, and there's another bloody glove at Nicole's house. But anyway, the police at this point didn't have a warrant yet to search the house, so they, they had to leave. They weren't able to get a warrant until, like, later that morning at, like, um, 10 a.m. Okay. And I, this is, what, 4.30 in the morning. So like I said, the night before, here's what we know of OJ. OJ went and got a burger with Cato at 9.30. And then 
At 11.45 p.m., he had a flight at LAX. That's the Los Angeles airport. He had a flight out to Chicago because he had a Hertz convention to go to. Um, apparently, his limo picked him up at 11.15. Who the fuck leaves at 11.15 when your flight is at 11.45? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And, okay, can you imagine rage-fueled OJ walking around an airport and riding a plane after just committing this murder? He just murdered two people, and then he goes to a Hertz convention. Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing him all rage-fueled, dude? Yeah, he had, because, like, there's no way that you could have hid the adrenaline that he had to have been feeling. Oh, my God, I know. Crazy. So now the day after the murder, OJ's in Chicago, and he was notified of Nicole's murder, and he was like, you got to get on a plane back home. So he gets on a plane back home. By then, the police had obtained a warrant to search his house, and they found more blood. So when he got home, the police immediately handcuffed him, but only for a moment. Because he was able to OJ his way out of it. Of course. And basically they agreed, like, we don't need handcuffs. OJ's going to meet us at the police station. (laughs) So the police questioned OJ, but they pretty much let him take the lead. Like, they allowed him to ramble on without giving any concrete details. Like, for example, they asked him what time he did something. He'd be like, must have been around 7, 8.30, maybe 9.30. Oh, my. (laughs) Gotcha, great, cool, 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 okay. Or the police would ask, what were you doing? And he'd say, oh, just running around, you know, doing what I do. (sighs) And not a single person is asking, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, oh. He just charms his way out of everything, and the police let him go home. That's insane. Enter Marsha Clark. Marsha Clark was the Los Angeles County prosecutor at the time, and she was just baffled at the way that the police were handling things. Like, she got word of all this at the time when they came to ask for the, the search warrant for his house. And she also was like, who? The, the sports guy? <laughs> 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 to this day, she is not over how the LAPD failed to question O.J. Simpson. I mean, they failed to establish a timeline because of that. Yeah, exactly. Also, OJ had a large cut on his left hand, and when the police asked about it, he was like, oh, I cut my hand in Chicago. But Marsha was like, well, then how the fuck did you get blood on your Bronco? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, then how? Uh, Ron Ship, remember, Ron Ship was his cop friend. He also heard OJ telling different people numerous versions of what happened to his hand. Like, he asked him what happened, and OJ was like, yeah, I cut my hand in Chicago. But then later, Ron heard him tell somebody else, oh, I cut my hand while chipping golf balls. And then later he told somebody else, yeah, I was getting something out of the Bronco and I cut my hand. On June 16th, OJ attended Nicole's funeral with their kids, Justin and Sydney. He was clearly self-medicating with something, like maybe Xanax. For a while, it seemed like he was just kind of stumbling around, like sedated. Mm, It's probably a good way to be. And, like, everyone at the funeral, everyone is looking at him, whispering, like, oh, my God, I can't believe he showed up. When Nicole's sister and her family were all notified of Nicole's death, and even Faye Resnick, all of them, all of them said it was OJ. He fucking killed her. Yeah, he did. And, like, who else? Who else? It was OJ. Who else? (laughs) So, after all this, uh, the media, of course, was going crazy, trying to, like, photograph oj and figure out what's happening in the meantime oj actually started wearing a disguise like as if he's not as if he's not oj simpson (laughs) yeah seriously okay okay uh i just picture him with like those like glasses with the big nose (sighs) so yeah so he's hiding out and he decides to go stay with his friend robert kardashian because nobody knew where rob kardashian lived Rob Kardashian is an Armenian millionaire. He's a former attorney and a close friend of OJ's. He's also the father of Courtney Kim and Khloe Kardashian. He was married to Kris Jenner at one point, and she and Nicole were besties, so the four of them were pretty close, and so were their kids. OJ and Rob Kardashian started putting together a team of lawyers that would become known as the Dream Team. This included Robert Shapiro, F. Lee Bailey, and Johnny Cochran. And Kardashian ended up renewing his his license so that he could also um, help represent. OJ also asked Ron Shipp to be a part of the team, but Ron was like, no way. <laughs> he actually said, I'm not on board. OJ killed her. Mm-hmm. 
The police decided that they were finally ready to arrest OJ, but Shapiro made a deal with them and agreed that he would take OJ to surrender himself to the police in order to avoid a media circus. That's privilege. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So OJ was expected to surrender himself at 11 a.m., but he had other plans. The entire world thinks that he's being arrested, and he bails. There was already a press conference scheduled and everything. Like, everybody literally thinks that he's about to be in jail. And Kardashian even said to him, like, hey, man, it's almost 11. We should really get going. And OJ was like, why should I hurry? What can they do to me? And Kardashian's like, well, I guess you're right. Oh, no. (laughs) Now everybody's like, holy shit, he's making a run for it. Meanwhile, Kardashian reads this letter at a press conference that was written by OJ, and it may or may not be a suicide letter. Like, it doesn't exactly read as a suicide letter, but it sounds a hell of a lot like one. Or, like, it could just be a goodbye letter because he knows he's going to prison. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. Um, I want to play a little clip of it in a little bit, but what he's saying is... I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. I loved her, always have, and always will. If we had a problem... It's because I love her. I loved her so much. First of all, I want everybody to know that I didn't kill Nicole, but whatever happened, it was only because I loved her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why ever she's dead, it's definitely because I loved her, and it also definitely wasn't me. I think of my life and feel I've done most of the right things. So why do I end up like this? I can't go on. No matter what the outcome, people will look and point. According to Kardashian, OJ really was talking about killing himself and was actually like going from room to room and like trying to find the right place to do it. He ultimately decided to go to the church where he got married and kill himself there. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to have AC drive me there. So Kardashian tried to talk him out of it. And he even tried to like stall. He was like, hey, let's all take a selfie together. And OJ made up his mind. So at this point, Kardashian just kind of like accepted it. He put it in the hands of fate and he decided that if a man wants to kill himself, he should be allowed to. So OJ and AC left and Kardashian fully believed that his friend was off to go kill himself. Hours after OJ was declared a fugitive, he was seen in the back of his white Bronco being driven by AC Kelling. OJ held a gun to his own head and told AC to drive or he was going to kill himself. The police were pursuing him, and this was like 20 police cars, but it wasn't exactly a chase like how people would refer to it um, still like 30 years later. It was like they were going like 35 miles per hour, so people said it looked more like a presidential motorcade, like all these police cars just kind of like slowly following him. It was like it wasn't a chase. It was more like a like a moving negotiation, you know? Yeah, exactly. There were news crews and helicopters broadcasting everything. And there was actually a basketball game that was going on at the same time. And a lot of people were watching, like millions of people were watching this game because it was game five of the NBA finals and the Rockets were playing the Knicks. So literally there ended up being like 95 million viewers who were just watching TV when the it was like suddenly interrupted with news broadcasts of OJ Simpson. And the little game, they would put like a picture in picture. So it was still in the corner of the screen, but like, Nobody could actually follow the little tiny ball in the corner of the screen, you know? Yeah, that's just a crazy thing to do. Like, at least let us choose if we want to watch it. Right, and so a lot of people were pissed, you know, because they were like, this is fucking important. And it's like, would they have done this in any other police chase, you know? Right. Also, because so many people were glued to their television sets during this, Domino's Pizza had record-breaking sales that day. That's a weird fact, but (laughs) isn't that funny? Yeah, that is funny. Good for Domino's. Yeah, good for them. (laughs) And throughout the whole Bronco chase, fans were on the side of the road, on the side of the highway, cheering on OJ. Like, they were holding up signs saying, go, OJ, go, and things like that. And that's because this was, like, right after the L.A. riots and the Rodney King beatings, and people legitimately thought that police were just, like, framing OJ. You know, they were just looking for black heroes to take down. Yeah. And also, when you think about it, I mean, the police came to OJ's house eight times, but he was only arrested, like, once. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people had their doubts about whether he was a bad guy at all or not, just like people still do. Right. 
So this pursuit would last about 45 minutes, and it, it was a span of like 60 miles that he drove. And it was just kind of like, I wouldn't say it's aimless driving. It's just that he had a bunch of places he wanted to go, and then the police got there before him, so he was like, fuck, we got to go somewhere else. First, they figured out that he wanted to go see his mom, who was back at his home at Rockingham. So they show up there before OJ, and he's like, fuck. So then OJ calls Nicole's father, who was at Nicole's house at Bundy, and he told him, like, hey, I'm going to stop by. So Nicole's father immediately called the police and was like, OJ's on his way over here. And they, you know, once OJ and AC got there, police were already there waiting. So then they headed to Nicole's grave. Again, too much heat. So around this time, Bob Shapiro held a press conference pleading for OJ to surrender. Like, he's trying to talk to OJ at this point for the sake of his children. But in all honesty, he's not even sure if OJ is alive right now. Like, him and Bob Kardashian and everybody else are back at Rockingham kind of mourning OJ, having accepted that he was going to kill himself. Oh, yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, because he had just said goodbye to everybody. He was walking around with Kardashian, like, trying to figure out where to kill himself. And then he said his goodbyes, got in his car. With a gun and AC, you know? Yeah. So Bob Shapiro spoke to OJ's kids, Arnell and Jason. They were the, the older kids from his first marriage. And he gave them this whole talk about how, like, your father loved you and he wanted you to have everything you needed. And he wanted to make sure you had all the money you needed. And Shapiro basically told them, your father's going to kill himself because he doesn't want to turn himself into the police. So Jason ran away crying. And Arnell sat down and she just kind of sobbed silently. And then suddenly a relative who was nearby, because at this point the whole family's there. So a relative nearby turned on the TV and was like, wait a minute, he's right there. So like they see him in the Bronco and Jason comes out and starts pleading, come on, dad, come on. At some point, the Bronco gets stopped in traffic and AC turned to the side and saw two police officers pointing guns right at him. They ordered him to cut his engine and he started screaming and swearing, shouting no. And he was like pouting on a steering wheel, like, Hard enough for the Bronco to start shaking. And mind you, throughout this pursuit, remember I said it looked like a presidential motorcade? The police didn't have any sirens on or any lights. And I don't know if maybe that's because OJ had a gun and, like, they were afraid of what he would do. But, I mean, isn't that weird? If this were any other person and there's just a guy in a gun and there's 20 police cars after him, wouldn't they have shot at him? Yeah, I feel like they at least would have, like, put the tracks down to, like, pop his yeah. tires. Like, that would have been so easy exactly. to do. Exactly. Or, like, pulled him to the side of the road or something. Like, it's not like he had a rifle or a machine gun, you know what I mean? It was like a little handgun. Yeah. I don't know what he thought was what, what they were afraid of. I, I think they honestly just didn't want to kill the football star. Probably. They didn't want to hurt him. They didn't want, they didn't want to hurt his good hand, you know? His, his, yeah, or his, his running legs. <laughs> Yeah, but it's so weird considering this was, at this point, it's only been three years since the beating of Rodney King, who, the whole thing started because he was speeding, you know, Rodney King was being pulled over for speeding and they beat him to death. So, like, why is this such, like, this is special treatment for OJ, you know, like, and why? It definitely is. Like, because he can run really fast while holding a ball? Yeah, Like, that's exactly. why, that makes him heroic? <laughs> that makes him not beatable to deathable. <laughs> Yeah, that makes him incapable of ever killing somebody, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> and like, speaking of being a black guy in the 90s, I bet AC was scared shitless to be running away from the police. And like, he had no other choice. Like, his options yeah. were either defy the police and like, cross his fingers, the consequences wouldn't be too bad. Or have his best friend blow his brains out in the backseat. Like, his best friend is yeah. giving him this ultimatum. That really would be the worst situation to be in and like if, if, when you like picture him like beating on the steering wheel trying to tell the police to back off so his best friend doesn't kill himself like that must be terrifying while the police are pointing guns at him yeah Ugh. so ac is fucking terrified and he decides to call 911 911, what are you reporting? This is, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. Okay, where are you? Please, I'm coming up the five freeway. Okay. Right now, we all we are okay, but you gotta tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. Okay, hold on a minute. He just wanna see his mother. Let me get him to the house. Okay, hold on a moment. 
Okay, where are you? Is everything else okay? Everything right now is okay, officer. Everything is okay. All about it. He wants to get me to give it to his mom. He wants me to give it to his daughter. Okay. So that's all I had. That's all we had. He got a gun in his head. Okay, and what, what's your name? My name is AC. You know who I am, God damn it. Okay. They're like, and who is this? It's like, are, are you not watching TV right now? Yeah. <laughs> how do you, how are you a 911 operator and don't know this is happening when fucking 20 police officers are chasing after him right now? I feel like on like every true crime, when you hear the 911 operator, they're like either so uninterested or like just, I feel like that's like a job requisite. They have to be just like oblivious to whatever. Um. So ultimately, AC calls 911 and afterwards, like he's talking to the police and he's like, just let us make it back to Rockingham. We'll stop. We'll stop driving and everything. Just let us make it home. And the police are like, okay, deal. Like, they're just going to they're just gonna meet their demands, you know. They're going to chase him around the city for 60 miles and be like, sure, we'll meet you at your house. After all this driving, <laughs> at a snail's pace, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, they're so, pa- they're so patient insane. with him, you know. How could they even do that? And, like, how are there so many people making bad decisions? If anything, they're like, like, no, meet us at the station, motherfucker, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, we're going to follow you to the station. He is running from the cops. Yeah. Oh my wow, God. that's insane. So they make it back to Rockingham, and AC pulls into OJ's neighborhood, but it was, like, packed with news vehicles. So they finally pulled into his driveway where there was a SWAT team waiting for him. Jason ran out to the car, super upset, and started yelling at AC, and a couple of officers pulled Jason back. AC said to the police, don't do anything stupid, he has a gun. So they gave OJ a phone to talk to an LAPD negotiator, and OJ basically demands, like, I need to talk to my mom. <laughs> Suddenly the phone dies, so AC goes inside to get another, and when he came out, OJ was like, you know what, I give up. And he peacefully surrendered at 8.53 p.m. He collapsed into the officer's arms and said, I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry I put you through this. Oh my goodness. I can't imagine that. He's a six-foot-tall football player collapsing into a police officer's arms like that. Yeah, they were probably like, it's okay, OJ. It's I bet okay. he did this to Nicole. Oh, for sure, without a doubt. Oh, man, that is so sad to think about. To just, like, crumble yeah. into her arms like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean this. Yeah, she was probably like, I can't believe I can break this man. He must really love me. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So before they take him in, they let him go to the bathroom and have some orange juice, which is like, ugh. The thought of OJ. Yeah, like, why is he always drinking orange juice? <laughs> because he's he is the juice. It's fucking right, weird. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, they let him talk to his mother one last time before they arrest him. And when they asked him if he was ready to go, he said yes. And then they handcuffed him. But they made sure that all of the lights were off outside so that it would be too dark for any photographers or anybody to see him. Which again, that's oh, fucking fire. privilege, isn't it? Yeah, seriously. I mean, the thought of having a perp walk is pretty fucking weird in itself, but yeah. who else gets this kind of protection from a perp walk, you know? Yeah, literally, I can't think of anyone. It's literally, literally like they did him that favor of like, don't worry, we'll make sure nobody sees you. Even though he's going to be on TV yeah. for the next fucking year in ha- handcuffs, yeah. you know? Cool. Yeah. Well, they probably didn't think so. They were probably like, oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah, because then... We'll fast forward and we'll see that when they interrogate him, they didn't actually want answers, you know? They let him go without any information. So it yeah. seems like, yeah, like they were like, oh, nothing's going to happen to him anyway. So, yeah, so nobody sees his perp walk. OJ was booked and he would remain incarcerated through the end of his trial, which would last 15 months. This was crazy. Yeah. And this is where we're going to end part one. So in part two, we'll get started right from the beginning of the trial. Um, and this trial is fucking bizarre. Like, legitimately was the trial of the century. This was the first mm-hmm. trial where they allowed cameras in the courtroom. Which I think had a big outcome on this. It had a huge outcome, which was really bizarre when you think about the fact that they sequestered the jury and didn't allow them to watch TV or talk to anybody about it. But they're like, hey, everybody else in the world, here's all the facts that the jury's not yeah. allowed to hear about. Yeah, that is really crazy. And this this case made the front page of LA Times for 300 days. And, like, because of all of this, like, media on it, there were other deaths that were getting, like, overshadowed. 
But at the same time, this is when tabloids became huge. Because celebrities were dying and media started seeing the money in that. Mm-hmm. Literally, they were like, oh, who else died? And they could sell some magazines. Um, so like I said, this happened in 1994 and the trial would go, the trial wouldn't end until like mid-1995. Wow. And this happened, what, June 94? Kurt Cobain had actually just died in March of 94. And Selena Quintanilla would just die like a year later in early 1995. So, like, all of these were highly publicized publicized cases, but you have to wonder if they might have overshadowed each other. Like, the media was just getting their rocks off, you know? So it was kind of like, you have to wonder how much of this was manipulated. You know, how much of it did we... For sure. Did we hear what they wanted us to hear? You know, we focused mm-hmm. on what they wanted us to focus on. Yeah, without a doubt. And this case was a total circus. Like... Okay, it's kind of like when I talked about, like, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, and they made fun of it on SNL. Like, okay, they made fun of this on SNL and everywhere else. Like, Jay Leno did a did a segment on The Tonight Show where he had a bunch of, like, chorus dancers who looked like the judge. His name was Judge Lance Ito. And they did this, like, jazz number with a lady who looked like Marsha Clark. I'm going to upload this to the website, too, because it's, like, it's so funny. But they call them the Dancing Itos. And, yeah, it's a bunch of guys, a bunch of Asian guys in, like, judge garb. It's the weirdest thing. But apparently, Ito loved it and at some point invited Jay Leno back to his chambers, which, like, is that allowed? Like, that's... Uh, Yeah. That doesn't sound okay, you know? No. So, yeah, every every little, little... There's so many things in the trial that it's like, could this really have ever been a fair trial for a celebrity? Like, could there really ever be a jury of your own peers in this case? Yeah. You know? Yeah, probably not. And it gets, it gets so much more, like, there's all these conflicts of interest, like, we're going to get into it. Um, but like I said, the next episode, we'll cover the evidence, how the police mishandled it, um, the tactics that the defense used to, like, confuse the jury, the way that Marsha Clark tried so fucking hard, but she just wasn't, like, cool or hip, jo- like Johnny Cochran, so nobody listened to her. Um, they almost had to, like, declare a mistrial and start all over. Like, this whole thing was a fucking mess. And mm-hmm. at the end of the day... He basically got let off the hook. And there's so much to talk about. Like, he he wrote books about this where he, like, responded to, like, letters and interviews. And and then he got arrested again in 2007 for stealing back his memorabilia, which is, like, ultimately what got him in prison. Yeah, which is so crazy to think about. And literally when they arrested him, they were like, this has nothing to do with the death of Nicole Brown, which definitely means it was. It yeah, has everything like, to do with it. <laughs> guy they would have arrested him while like walking his dog if they could have you know yeah for sure okay so um that's everything um we're gonna go more into the timeline and shit because it's gonna go into the testimony and all the witnesses and everything and why this case failed because i'll say it again um spoiler oj is the killer (laughs) for sure oj simpson is the killer And and I'll I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how everybody and his mama fucking knows that he did it. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um so yeah, and um Haley's gonna help us break down some of the theories surrounding it too, and we're gonna kinda like dissect it and see where we can get the truth out of that and what else is just kinda like um what's the word? Speculation. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so um, don't forget that you can go to brokenlimelight.com and it's literally like a follow along to the episode. There's pictures and videos and a transcript of this. Um, I'll link all of the interviews that I can find um, that I've talked about in here. And yeah, I'm gonna tag Haley on the posts about this. So Haley, tell us about your um, social media, where we can find you and what we can see on there. Yeah, uh, most of my social media handles are at Haley Up and Coming, and then I just go by my name on Facebook, Haley McConnell. Um, I post a lot of stuff on there. I post a lot of stuff about confidence and um, just becoming the best version of yourself. So it's pretty fun over with me on my socials. Thank you. For sure. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Um, this was a lot of fun to talk to you about. So I'm really excited to get into part two and like break everything down with you. Me too. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, don't forget to follow us on social media. I'm Dee Dee West, and um, I'm under Broken Limelight. I'm on TikTok. Uh, and you can go to ddwestmusic.com for anything else about me. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.
Hey fam, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. We are back for part two of our coverage of O.J. Simpson and the murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and Ronald Goldman. Haley couldn't be here with me today. We had a little bit of a scheduling conflict. It's basically the same reason Summer hasn't been here. And Summer will be back. It's just like all three of us are moms and we're all entrepreneurs. So unfortunately, we have to work around each other a lot and things come up. But Haley will be back for part three, which (laughs) newsflash, there's going to be a part three. But in this episode, we're going to go pretty in depth with the entire criminal trial. First of all, I want to say something. I'm going to backtrack on something I said before, just a little bit, not completely. Remember when I said that I felt pretty certain that OJ was guilty? Well, I'm not saying he's not, but since researching, I found a few things that I just, I just can't find answers to. And it's becoming all the more clear to me that I don't think it is possible for him to ever have a fair trial, especially now, unless we get any new evidence. And that'll tie into when we talk about all the conspiracy theories and like we'll try to tie together all the evidence and look at every point of view and all the possibilities why he could be the killer, why he could not be the killer. If not him, who else possibly could it have been? Even if it's just to play the devil's advocate, I think it's something that we need to look at. So we left off at part one with the end of the Bronco chase. AC and OJ drove back to OJ's home at Rockingham, where the police were waiting to arrest him. He was handcuffed in the dark so that nobody could witness his perp walk and then taken back to the police station, where he was finally booked. OJ peacefully surrendered himself to the police and was booked on June 17, 1994. At no point during his arrest, or even before his arrest, did he ask what happened to Nicole. Marsha Clark was a prosecutor, and she was kind of known for being a little bit bitchy and... She also kind of got teased a lot for being unfashionable, which is like stupid and irrelevant. But nonetheless, the media kind of made a spectacle of her appearance. And the entire country was watching and forming these stupid little opinions about Marsha Clark's hair and her outfits and shit like that. Also, the jury straight up just didn't like Marsha. Marsha thought the case would be an easy win, and she had always been pretty successful at talking to women and minorities, so she thought that she could just talk to them and get on their level and they would understand her. That didn't happen. Surveys show that most of the female juries thought Marsha Clark was a bitch. Marsha often seemed grouchy as shit, like she was a workaholic and she also had a lot of things going on in her personal life, like she was going through a divorce and a custody battle. Plus, she was fucking annoyed with this case and the police because everybody was batting their eyes at oj simpson after he just murdered two people in her eyes anyway she was frustrated because people at work like police officers and lawyers continuously called him oj as she pointed out nobody calls charles manson chuck but people were starry-eyed with oj so she actually kept a swear jar but for ojs instead of swear words oj was arraigned on july 2nd 1994 He pleaded not guilty and they scheduled the preliminary hearing for June 30th. The defense had to figure out how to deal with the physical evidence against O.J. Simpson, which was overwhelming. There was a bloody glove found at the crime scene at Nicole's home at Bundy, and then the other glove, the partner to that glove, was found on O.J.'s property at Rockingham. These gloves had traces of blood and hair from Nicole and Ron, so whoever wore these gloves had to be the killer. We'll find out later that... The DNA evidence points to OJ's DNA being on the gloves as well. The defense realized that they couldn't argue or deny the physical evidence, so instead, they planned to make the evidence seem unreliable. First, they tried to convince the jury that the police had planted the evidence in order to frame OJ. Then, they would show that investigators mishandled the evidence, and ultimately, they were able to straight up confuse the jury who simply didn't have a good understanding of DNA evidence. They were also able to show that members of the LAPD were racist and had in the past spoken planting evidence and framing people and saying hateful things towards black people. The jury ends up having eight women and four men, eight black, one white, one Hispanic, and two people of mixed race. Jurors were told that they were going to be sequestered and probably kept for six months. What this means is that they're going to be like taken away from their homes, put in a hotel. They can't talk to anybody about the case. They can't watch any TV or any media. They can't talk about the case with each other. 
basically they're coming to work and then outside of they're doing their duties of the jury, they don't talk about the case. Both the defense and the prosecution need to approve the jury selection. And after they do that and everybody's walking out of the room, OG took a look at the jury and, you know, got a good look at the diversity and says to his team, guys, if this jury convicts me, maybe I did do it. The defense sees the diversity of the jury and runs with the idea of turning the case into an issue of racism. By the way, they allowed cameras into the courtroom for this case, which had never been done before. So the jury is not allowed to get any outside information about the case. But meanwhile, everybody on the outside of the case has direct eyes into the trial and what's going on in court. The trial begins and at the very last minute, a new lawyer is added to the prosecution, Chris Darden, who was a black man. The prosecution was all white just a moment ago. So when Darden shows up so suddenly, some of the black jurors were like, well, where did hell, where the hell did this guy come from? Right away, they started to distrust the prosecution because they now have the impression that they brought in a black guy just because he's black. And they, I don't know, thought maybe that would manipulate the minds of the jurors somehow. The defense has this plan to show the jury that Mark Furman is so racist that he planted evidence and set up O.J. Simpson to take the fall for Nicole's murder. Remember, Mark Furman was the police officer who found the bloody glove at O.J. Simpson's house at Rockingham. So the defense is trying to prove that he didn't just find the glove, he actually planted the glove. Proving that Mark Furman was a racist was really, really easy. He had at one point sued the L.A. Pension Board asking to be relieved as a police officer to receive pension because his mind was so poisoned by hatred of black people. These were his words. He also did an interview with a writer at some point who had actual audio recordings of him saying the N-word many, many times, as well as discussing police brutality enthusiastically. In the documentary O.J. Made in America, Furman describes the night when he was called to the residence after O.J. bashed Nicole's car with a bat. Furman describes arriving at the residence and seeing O.J. sitting down holding a bat and Mark tells him to put it down. OJ doesn't listen. He just stares like in a blind rage, like he's ready to go into battle. That's how Mark describes it. So Mark's tell him a second time and he still doesn't listen. Finally, Mark pulls out his baton and tells him a third time, put the bat down. Suddenly, OJ's whole demeanor changes and there was a sudden calm that came over his face. And then he said, oh, I'm sorry, officer. Furman says he then asked Nicole if she wanted to make a report and she said no. Then Furman tells the camera that he recalls feeling displeasure that she was allowing herself to be treated like that. And then he tells Nicole, it's your life. The defense introduces to the court Mark Furman's file, and they want to present every single time that he used a racial slur. The judge, Judge Ito, has to decide if all of this is going to be admissible. Chris Darden was the one to argue for the prosecution, and he argued that just hearing the N-word was going to blind the jury and make all of this about race instead of focusing on the murder and the evidence. He tried to explain that the word carried too much weight, but then Johnny Cochran got up to refute this, and he's mad. He's saying that Darden's remarks are demeaning to African Americans, saying that they live with offensive words, looks, and treatment every day of their lives, and to say that they can't clearly think in the presence of this word is outrageous, and he's ashamed that Darden would become an apologist for Mark Furman. Ultimately, Judge Ito allows it. F. Lee Bailey would cross-examine Furman and ask him if he's ever used the N-word at any time in the previous 10 years. And by the way, while he's questioning him, he's not saying the N-word like I am. They're actually, they're saying the actual word. Bailey says it multiple times, and it really does kind of sting when you hear it today. Anyway, Furman says, nope, I have not used that word in the past 10 years. Again, there are recordings of him saying it, so we know now that he lied on the stand. Marsha Clark had a real problem here because Mark Furman was the officer who found the bloody glove at OJ's home at Rockingham. So this was like the biggest piece of evidence, and she kind of has to bring him on the stand, even though everybody knows that they can't believe a single fucking word that he says. Because if she doesn't bring Mark Furman on the stand and he was the one that found the glove, then it kind of looks like she's admitting that he did plant the evidence. In February 1995, the jury was shown the contents of Nicole's secret safety deposit box. Inside the safety deposit box were diaries and photos documenting the abuse, as well as a will that Nicole had prepared dated September 30th, 1990. 
There were also news articles and letters that OJ had written her that said things like, how did I get so crazy? And let me start by expressing to you how wrong I was for hurting you. There is no acceptable excuse for what I did. Darden said, it appears to us what Nicole Brown was doing was leaving a trail for us of what happened in 1989. These letters were shown in the courtroom on a big screen, but the judge didn't allow the news articles to be entered as evidence, and the jurors were not shown the photos right away. The defense then questioned Ron Shipp, who was a friend of O.J. Simpson's and Nicole's, and a former police officer who would give in, he gave, like, trainings for domestic abuse situations. Nicole had confided in him about the abuse, and O.J. had tried to hire him for his legal team, but he refused because he says that he knows O.J. did it. Ron said on the stand that the day after the murders, O.J. confided in him that he had had dreams about killing Nicole. The defense tried to paint Ron Shipp as a starstruck wannabe friend to O.J. who secretly had feelings for Nicole, but Ron stood by his account. Ron also said that he saw O.J. throughout the week after the murders and he didn't seem sad or seem to show any sense of loss or grief over Nicole. He did say that O.J. seemed angry as he watched the news and saw reports about himself being accused of murdering them, but never sad. During a break in questioning, Ron Shipp turned to O.J. and mouthed to him across the room, Tell the truth, O.J. O.J. appeared not to notice, and Judge Ito sternly told the jurors to disregard that remark. On February 12, 1995, the jurors took a field trip to the crime scene at Bungie and also to O.J.'s home at Rockingham. Apparently, these kinds of field trips are unusual but not completely unprecedented, but in this case, it would cost thousands of dollars in police overtime and it literally halted traffic. The residents of Brentwood were basically forced to quarantine because all the traffic was making it impossible to leave their homes. The reason they also went to OJ's house and not just Nicole's was because they wanted the jury to consider whether OJ could actually have time to get home from McDonald's, go kill two people, and get back home in time for his flight. OJ's home at Rockingham was only about a five-minute drive from Nicole's home on Bundy. The jurors were able to see the area where Nicole and Ron were killed, though the blood had been cleaned up and it was now just covered in police tape. They had traced outlines of the shoe prints for them to observe. Heading inside in groups of four, they then viewed the rooms where Nicole Simpson had drawn herself a candlelit bath, left a cup of half-eaten ice cream, and then put her children to bed before she was killed. Everything was labeled by signs so nobody would have to say a word to the jurors and they were not allowed to talk to each other either. There were requests made to hide things like trophies and statues of OJ and a complaint was made that they should take down the photos of OJ with his kids and his new girlfriend Paula saying that it wouldn't be fair for the jury to see that but Judge Ito ultimately ignored the complaint. There were hundreds of police officers from the LAPD on duty along with the bomb-sniffing Black Labrador. Twenty policemen on motorcycles escorted the unmarked car carrying O.J. while four police helicopters hovered overhead. On March 29th, O.J.'s limo driver from the night of the murders was questioned. His name was Alan Park. Remember how O.J.'s flight was at 11.45 p.m., but he didn't actually leave his house until 11.15? Well, the driver, Alan Park, actually arrived at O.J.'s house at 10.22 p.m. and waited there for nearly an hour. He drove around the front of the house while he was looking for the house number, and he did not see OJ's white Bronco, nor did he see it 17 minutes later when he tried driving around the house to find another entrance. He tried ringing the intercom a few times, but nobody answered, so he went back to his car. At about 11 p.m., he saw a dark figure walk into the driveway, which he described as someone about six feet tall and weighing 200 pounds, and they appeared to be black. He says, That's when I got back up and out of the car and rang the intercom. This time, there was an answer, which was Mr. Simpson. He told me that he overslept and he just got out of the shower and he would be down in a minute. OJ's neighbor testified that he did not see the white Bronco when he walked his dog around the Simpson estate between 9.30 and 9.45 on the evening of June 12th. He further testified that on June 13th at around 7 a.m., he noticed the Bronco parked on Rockingham at a weird angle. Alan Park also saw OJ carrying a knapsack out of his house, but... After they got to the airport, he unloaded his stuff, and he didn't have the knapsack anymore. It's theorized that the knapsack may have contained the murder weapon and his bloody clothes, and that he may have stashed the knapsack into a bigger bag before his flight. The prosecution called a witness who saw OJ at the airport standing next to a trash can, reached down into his bag and grabbing something before throwing it away and then closing his bag again. Now let's talk about the physical evidence for a sec. The evidence is a bloody pair of gloves. 
One glove was found at the crime scene, which was Nicole's house, and the other was found on the Rockingham property by Mark Furman. The gloves each had blood from Nicole and Ron, indicating that whoever they belonged to or whoever was wearing them was the killer. There is also blood on the gloves that is consistent with OJ's. There were trails of blood leading from the crime scene down the alley and into OJ's Bronco. The defense had a guy on their team named Barry Sheck who was super experienced in working with DNA, which was pretty rare at this time. By 1994, DNA analysis was still pretty new, and the common person didn't really know anything about it. Shows like CSI didn't start coming out until like 2000, so even when clear evidence was presented, a lot of people didn't really understand it. It was kind of junk science at this point. Barry Sheck knew how to poke holes in the evidence and made it go from something concrete to something vague. On April 11, 1995, the defense brought in LAPD criminologist Dennis Fung to the stand. They questioned him about how evidence is collected and what measures are taken to make sure it isn't tampered with. Sheck was so detailed in his questioning that everybody was getting kind of annoyed. He questioned Fung for nine days about every little detail of how he did his job. He was on the stand longer than any other witness. Unfortunately for Fung, he did a number of things that would end up looking pretty questionable. For one, he admitted that when collecting blood from the crime scene, he had missed a couple of drops, but then he went back later to get them. He also admitted that he did not wear rubber gloves while collecting the evidence, and also that he had to shoo the dog away from the DNA, so it's possible that little Kato the Akita contaminated the evidence as well. Fung had said in the past that he personally was the one who collected the leather gloves, and it was later discovered that he was actually supervising a trainee named Andrea Mazzola, and she was the one who actually collected the gloves and placed them into a bag. Sheck said to him, You did not tell the grand jury that Andrea Mazzola was the one who picked up the hat and picked up the glove? You did not tell the grand jury about the existence of Andrea Mazzola at all? And the testimony you gave the grand jury was under oath? Fung conceded to all three questions, but would later say, It wasn't a conscious decision. It's just the way I answered the questions. Andrea Mazzola admitted to a few mistakes at the crime scene while collecting evidence, including using one swatch to collect blood from three separate spots in the Ford Bronco, and occasionally not changing gloves when picking up different pieces of evidence. Then, there was a vial of blood that they took from OJ at the police station, and an officer named Van Adder put it in his pocket and drove 20 miles, and hand-delivered it to Fong, which is weird, and it shows that there was a big opportunity for police to frame O.J. Simpson. Van Adder would also be accused of planting the bloody sock in O.J.'s bedroom. Fung acknowledged that there was bloody evidence that was placed in a plastic containers and left in a vehicle from 11.30 a.m. to about 6.30 p.m. So that's about seven hours, and this was in June in California, so it must have been a hot day. Also, at the crime scene, the police took a blue blanket from inside of Nicole's house and they used it to cover her body. Of course, that blanket could have had OJ's DNA on it, which would now contaminate the crime scene. It was also discovered that Ron Goldman's bloody shirt was placed in a bag while still wet and had developed an odor, so it was definitely not stored properly. The bloody sock from OJ's bedroom had a preservative in it and the defense tried to say that it had too much of the preservative. I mean, this is a disaster. Like, the prosecution is like, there is a trail of blood from their bodies to his car and into his bedroom. But the police fucked up so bad with handling the evidence that the defense could imply that whoever the real killer is, their DNA has been wiped clean by the police. Not only are they saying that the police framed OJ, but that their negligence is letting some other killer get away. Fung was asked why they didn't put police tape around the Ford Bronco, and he said, it wasn't necessary. There was nobody around. Later, people would be seen touching the Bronco and photographing it. After nine days, Fung finally leaves the stand, and as he's exiting the courtroom, he stops and shakes hands with OJ and his lawyers. At this point, the jury is also exiting the courtroom, and it's unclear how many of them saw that. Earlier in that day, Bob Shapiro had handed out some fortune cookies and said, these are from Hang Fung Restaurant. It was supposed to be a joke, I guess. He would later apologize to Fung about that, and I guess it's possible that Fung shaking hands with OJ's team was just a way to say no hard feelings after that fortune cookie thing. Still, it's really hard to know what that was about, and it just fucking looked weird. 
By April 1995, the jurors were growing impatient and claustrophobic. A few of them were recused by this point, like Jeanette Harris, who lied about whether she had been involved in a domestic violence situation. So they were replaced by alternates, but the jury remained mostly people of color. There would be racial tensions among them. Harris said that she was kicked by a white juror and that the deputies treated the white jurors better than everyone else. She said that the jury was divided by race and also said that the jurors were going against Ito's instructions by talking to their families and to each other about the case. Again, they're not allowed to talk to anybody and they can't watch TV or have any kind of media that might influence their opinion in the case. The deputies were searching their rooms all the time and they felt violated. Ito had three sheriffs reassigned and the jury was getting fed up. They refused to go to court one day until Judge Ito made them. And when they finally appeared, many of them were wearing all black, kind of like a funeral. Like, this was supposed to be a protest. At this point, the case is already at risk of a mistrial because the defense and the prosecution are constantly shooting down everything the other one says and making objections to argue, like, legal definitions and shit. And then, like, the jury members are getting replaced left and right and they're running out of alternates. It's clear that Judge Ito has completely lost control of his courtroom, so... He was like, okay, let's take a break for a couple days so he could talk to the jurors individually. After a four-day hiatus, they resumed with the testimonies. On May 1st, a black juror pleaded with Judge Ito that she couldn't take it anymore, and he found good cause to excuse her from the jury. She was replaced by a Hispanic woman. There are only five alternates left at this point. The jury now has seven blacks, three whites, and two Hispanics. There are nine women and three men. On May 2nd, a forensic chemist testified that a sample from a bloody trail near the spot where Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were killed was found to be consistent with OJ's blood type. Blood and enzyme tests revealed that blood found alongside the trail of bloody shoe prints leading from the murder scene was the same type as OJ's blood. Only 0.5% of the population, or 1 in 200 people, have that blood type. There were tests done on the bloody glove that was found at the crime scene as well as on the back gate, and they showed that that blood was consistent with Ron's blood type, and of course there was blood on the front gate that was consistent with Nicole's blood type. Ron Goldman's family filed a lawsuit against OJ for wrongful death, seeking monetary damages, and accused him of outrageous savagery. On May 8th, a molecular biologist and DNA expert took the stand and explained how the testing used was the most accurate in existence at that time. She also explained that if evidence had degraded because of being improperly stored, it wouldn't just turn it into OJ's DNA. They also testified that the blood that was found on the bottom of Ron Goldman's shoe was consistent with Nicole's blood type. Then they said that, judging from one of OJ's blood samples taken from Nicole's driveway, had an extremely rare bonding pattern. Supposedly, the odds that the blood could come from anybody other than OJ Simpson were about 1 in 170 million. They did admit that putting the evidence in plastic bags and then, like, inside of a truck without air conditioning on a hot day would not be their first choice of procedure, but they also suggested that the real harm would only be caused if the evidence was treated this way for an extended period of time. For days and days, Barry Sheck would question all of these scientists and the DNA experts, and throughout, he tried to prove that DNA testing can be imprecise and that the results are open to interpretation. On May 19th, what would have been Nicole's 36th birthday, the prosecution described in gruesome detail their version of how she was killed. They believe that Nicole opened the door expecting Ron, but instead encountered OJ, who immediately subdued her. Then, Ron happened to walk up and see what OJ was doing to Nicole, and as he started to run towards her, OJ grabbed him from behind with his left hand and likely put the knife at Ron's throat with his right hand. Ron may have tried to reach for OJ's left hand to try and free himself and rip the glove off of OJ's hand where it fell into some foliage. Assistant District Attorney Brian Kelberg insisted that it was necessary for the jury to see the photos of the injuries so that they can see that it was done by someone in rage, like an abusive ex-husband. Barry Shett questioned a criminologist named Colin Yamaguchi who admitted that he got a small stain of blood on his glove after having held a vial with OJ Simpson's blood in it. This presented a problem because Yamaguchi failed to record the exact times that he handled each piece of evidence. He also handled OJ's glove, but we have no idea if he handled the glove and then the vial, or if he handled the vial first and then transferred the blood onto OJ's glove. 
More jurors were recused, mainly because they were talking about the case to each other or discussing, like, book deals. With only two alternates left and months to go, everybody's kind of nervous that this could end in a mistrial. On June 6th, the jury and two remaining alternates heard from a medical examiner who also offered a detailed description of how Nicola and Ron died. He graphically described this photograph that showed Nicole's face and below it her neck wound, which was completely gaping and exposing, like the wound actually exposed part of her spinal cord. The medical examiner said that the photos helped to prove the theory that Nicole was probably knocked unconscious in a struggle before her assailant turned to Ron and killed him. Then the assailant returned to Nicole, who was laying face down, on, and this is based on the autopsies. He concluded that Nicole tried to fight back based on the cuts and bruises on her hands. The blow to the head that she received not only knocked her out, but it bruised her brain. When her neck was slit, he said that she was probably face down because she didn't swallow any blood through her air pipe. The fatal wound was probably inflicted by a right-handed person using a single-edged knife. Judge Ito repeatedly told the jury that they were allowed to take a break or excuse themselves if they were uncomfortable looking at any of the crime scene photos. None of them did. On June 8th, the court day ended abruptly when one of the jury members who sits in the front row of the jury box left the courtroom during the testimony of the medical examiner. She had been seated immediately in front of the autopsy photos that showed Ron Goldman's brutally slashed body. The medical examiner also testified that the killer may have held a knife to Goldman's throat, slicing superficial parallel wounds while threatening him. He further testified that it could have taken a man of O.J. Simpson's strength and size less than a minute to inflict the wounds on Ron. He believed the killer was holding Ron Goldman from behind and sliced the knife lightly across his throat before inflicting a final gash that severed his jugular vein and damaged his aorta. Because this little area in front of Nicole's house was gated, he believed that the killer could have trapped Ron and killed him in less than a minute. He said, If Mr. Goldman was confronted by the assailant in this confined area, he has no place to escape, especially if he's cornered between that railing and that tree and that sapling. He's stuck there. As he's explaining this, he's using Brian Kelberg, one of the prosecutors, like, as an example. Like, in the courtroom, as he's explaining how Nicole was killed, he actually grabs Kelberg's hair and pulls it back and acts like he's slashing his throat. Like, this whole thing was, it was so extra. Like, this is such a drama. And then when he explains Ron's murder, he went up behind Kelberg and grabbed him while using a ruler, like, pretending it's a knife and slashing his throat. Like, they're doing this in the courtroom, and he's like, and then he grabbed her like this. Like, this must have been such a fucking spectacle. The coroner described more of Ron Goldman's injuries. He had abrasions on top of bruises on his hands that appeared to be caused by his hands flailing about and maybe hitting tree branches and the gate. The defense tried to claim that Ron had punched OJ, but the injuries on his hands were not those of a closed fist having hit someone, and OJ had no bruises on him immediately following the murders. This is what the coroner's saying. On the anniversary of the murders, Nicole Brown's father filed a wrongful death suit just one day before the statute of limitations would run out, charging that OJ planned and prepared to assault, batter, and murder Nicole Brown Simpson. On the seventh day of the medical examiner's examination, he described three of the fatal stab wounds to Ron Goldman. There were two gashes to his chest that cracked through a rib and punctured his right lung, and a third that hit the aorta, the major artery leading from the heart. There was also a fatal cut across Ron's neck. The medical examiner told jurors that after slashing his throat, the killer may have poked him in the face at least four or five times with a knife just to see if he was actually dead. He said, They are all superficial punctures, and I have no way of knowing exactly why they were done. It could have been inflicted to check whether he was still alive or not. That would be one conclusion I would draw also. OJ does not have an alibi for this time. He says he was either at home sleeping or chipping golf balls. On June 13th, the testimony was focused on OJ's demeanor on his flight to Chicago on the evening of the murders and the following day when he was told about it. A succession of witnesses testified that OJ was cordial and relaxed on the flight from LA to Chicago 
and he did not have a cut on his left hand. I don't know. That seems like way too specific. Like if somebody were to ask me if somebody on a plane had a cut on their hand, I probably wouldn't have checked. On the flight home from Chicago, witnesses who either took Simpson to the airport or accompanied him back to Los Angeles described him as frantic, looking skyward, sighing and moaning frequently. His left finger was either wrapped in a bloody band-aid or wrapped in a paper towel, based on what the witnesses had said. A Beverly Hills private intern examined OJ on June 15, 1994, three days after the murders and then again two days later. He said that OJ was suffering from osteo and rheumatoid arthritis, which most likely prevented him from running or doing any other aerobic activity. He also testified that he carefully looked for cuts, scratches, and bruises on OJ's body that may have indicated that he had a struggle with someone, but he said he found no evidence of such wounds. He noted that OJ had constant pain from surgery on his left wrist following a football injury from 1965. OJ also developed large knuckles that was typical of osteoarthritis, and he suffered from osteoarthritis in his left knee. But, in a blow to the defense, this private intern also conceded under cross-examination that despite OJ's arthritic condition, he was still strong enough to kill two people in the manner that was being suggested by the prosecution. So despite all of these illnesses, he was like, yeah, he still could have done it. At the end of the day, jurors were shown portions of an exercise video featuring OJ Simpson performing various exercises. This video was taped from May 24th to May 27th, 1994, just two and a half weeks before the murders. On July 18th, jurors were shown another commercial exercise video that was also made just a few weeks before Nicole's murder. During the video workout filmed May 26, 1994, OJ can be seen shadow boxing, throwing jabs and uppercuts, and he says, get your space in if you're exercising with your wife, if you know what I mean. And then he smiled and said, you can always blame it on working out. Another video was presented of a promotional speech that OJ gave in March of 1994. In the video, OJ talks about a vitamin supplement called Juice Plus, saying that the product had so relieved his arthritis symptoms that he had quit taking conventional medication and pain relievers. In August, the focus shifts back to Mark Furman. During cross-examination, Furman had denied using the N-word in the previous 10 years, but the defense located a recorded interview Furman did with a writer where he talks about framing people, setting people up, and filing false reports. And he also says the N-word, like, I think it's like 42 times. The defense planned to show that, one, he's a racist and a corrupt cop, and two, he lied on the stand when he said he didn't use the N-word, effectively perjuring himself. So now, no matter what he says, we can't fucking believe him, which is tough, because he's the one that found the evidence. Now, here's the kicker that nobody could have fucking seen coming. As the defense and the prosecution are all listening to the tapes, they come across something alarming. In these interviews, Furman complained about a high-ranking female police officer named Peggy York, who was his supervising commander. And he talks a lot of shit about this Peggy York. So let me read. This is something from Marsha Clark's book. It's called Without a Doubt. It says... Mark had described two run-ins with York, including one during which she upbraided the squad for writing KKK on the calendar entry for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Mark had snickered, and when she called him on it in private, he claimed he belittled her to her face. In another dust-up, he refused an assignment from her, supposedly saying, I don't talk to anybody that isn't a policeman, and you're as far from a policeman as I've seen, and as far as that goes, you're about as far from a woman as I've seen. He also said that she, quote, sucked and fucked her way to the top. About women in general, he said, I won't eat with them. I won't have coffee with them. I won't be seen with them. It's embarrassing. Where does some woman five feet tall and 98 pounds get off coming out? I can bench press almost four times what she weighs. I think he's talking about police women coming out to job assignments. So here's the kicker. Peggy York is the wife of Judge Lance Ito. This is a huge conflict of interest because they're trying to decide if he should allow these tapes to be heard in the court. If Ito allows the tapes to be heard in court, he could be perceived as doing so to punish Furman. But now if he doesn't allow the tapes to be played in court, 
it could be seen as though he's trying to avoid the embarrassment of issues regarding his wife coming before the jury. Or like he's trying to protect the police force because his wife is on it and he doesn't want to like make an embarrassment out of them right now. So Judge Ito was like, I need to take a step back. He admitted that he cannot make the decision about whether or not it's fair for him to preside over this case. So they have another judge make the call, and ultimately it's decided that Ito can continue to preside over the case. But the tapes would not be admissible except for two hours out of the 13 hours of recording. And by the way, if you're interested in seeing Judge Ito's ruling, I have uploaded a link to the Broken Limelight website. So they moved on and they continued with trying to prove that Mark Furman is a liar, as he absolutely has said the N-word in the past 10 years. In fact, he said it over 40 times in the recording, and he also recounted numerous episodes of police harassing black suspects, contriving evidence against them, and acknowledging that he participated in such activities himself. Here are some of the things he said. Do you people, don't you shoot to wound them? No, we shoot to kill them. Now the department says we shoot to stop, not kill, which is horseshit. The only way we can stop somebody is to kill the son of a bitch. And what's the big deal? If you've got reason to shoot somebody, you've got reason to kill them. No, if I would have arrested the son of a bitch, I would have killed him. If I ever see the son of a bitch and we're alone, I would kill him. If there's anybody except him and me, dead men tell no tales. See, he killed two policemen. I have an obligation. If I ever have the opportunity, I should kill him. And that's all there is to it. I didn't arrest him under anything. Just took him to the station, ran him for prints, gave him to the detective to compare with what they've got in the area. I'll probably arrest a criminal that way. I'd be able to correlate exactly what I said into a reasonable probable cause for arrest. Even though there's no evidence that Furman planted OJ's bloody glove at the crime scene, the fact that he's admittedly planted evidence in the past means that the defense could move to have all the evidence found by Furman to be thrown out. By now, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown's families are pissed because the entire focus has shifted to whether or not Mark Furman is a racist. And this is not a trial against Mark Furman. This is about the murders of Nicole and Ron. During an emotional press conference, Fred Goldman said that the tapes had no business at the trial, which is supposed to determine whether O.J. Simpson killed his son and Nicole Brown Simpson. He said, There was no reason to have two hours of this hate to be spewed out over the public airwaves. My son Nicole and her family have a right to a fair trial, and this is not fair. Marsha Clark said, This is a murder case where none of this is relevant. The admission of this evidence, meaning the tapes, is telling the jury, Disregard the case. Look somewhere else. And even if the bloody glove gets thrown out, there's still so much DNA evidence at the crime scene in the Bronco and leading up to OJ's house. Marsha goes on to say that if Mark Furman had the opportunity to plant anything, he would have been foolish to try, not knowing whether or not there were eyewitnesses to come to the crime or whether Simpson had an alibi. How could Furman possibly know for sure that OJ Simpson would not have an alibi I mean, he's super fucking famous. He easily could have been at a club or at a party or at an award show or something. Like, how could you possibly know that somebody isn't doing shit? Like, how could you know he would just be sitting at home sleeping or chipping golf balls? But the defense continued with their plan and they started bringing in witnesses to testify to Furman's racism. There was a woman named Kathleen Bell who had met Mark at a Marine recruiting center. At one point, Mark told Bell that when he sees a black man driving with a white woman, he pulls over the car. Bell asked him if he needed a reason. According to her, he said he'd find something. I asked what if they're in love. He said, that's disgusting. In the same conversation, she testified that Furman said, if I had my way, I'd gather all the, he says a racial slur, together and burn them. Bell said that she called the LAPD to report Furman, but she could only recall his first name. She said she didn't ask for his last name before because she was afraid of him. A second witness named Natalie Singer testified that Mark Furman's partner dated her roommate in 1987 and that both officers were frequently guests in her home. She quoted Furman as saying, The only good N-word is a dead N-word. On a later date, she kicked Furman out of the house for calling her a fucking bitch. She next saw him several years later testifying against O.J. Simpson, prompting her to call the defense. On September 6th, Mark Furman was brought back to the witness stand. He was asked, was the testimony that you gave in this case completely truthful? 
He replied, I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. When somebody pleads the Fifth, basically what that means is I have a right not to incriminate myself and you can't force me to say something incriminating. So they're asking him, was the last testimony that you gave in this case completely truthful? And he replies, I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Then he's asked, have you ever falsified a police report? He replies, I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Then he's asked, is it your intention to assert your Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to each question I ask you? He looks at his lawyer for a second, kind of like for approval. And then he answers, yes. And then he's asked, I only have one other question. Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? And he replies, I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. So this looks shady as fuck. On September 11th, the prosecution began presenting its rebuttal case, even though the defense had not finished its case. The first rebuttal witness was a photographer who took a picture of O.J. Simpson in 1990 during a Chicago Bears football game. And Simpson was like broadcasting the game. In that photograph, Simpson is wearing dark gloves that the state contends are the same gloves as the ones found at the murder scene and at Simpson's home after the murders. The defense requested that the jury be instructed to forget the glove had ever been found, which Ito denied. On the 13th, the prosecutors failed to show up for an early hearing, and the judge fined them $250. Marsha Clark complained because the defense attorneys had shown up late to other hearings without any fine. Judge Ito increased their fine to $1,000. Los Angeles District Attorney Gil Garcetti berated Judge Ito at a press conference, calling his conduct outrageous, petty, and uncalled for. Garcetti said his office would not pay the fine and sent another lawyer to court to appeal it. Judge Ito backed down and reinstated the original $250 penalty. On September 21st, the jury is informed that they can consider first-degree or second-degree charges. The difference is really whether or not the murders were premeditated. Ron Goldman's murder was almost certainly not premeditated because OJ would have had no way of knowing if he was going to be at Nicole's house. Like the theory is that OJ or whoever the killer was got to Nicole's house and Ron happened to be there. Nobody planned to kill Ron Goldman. But Nicole's murder may well have been premeditated. So OJ could either be charged for first degree and second degree and automatically face a life sentence without parole, or if he's convicted of two second-degree murders, the sentence includes the possibility of parole. O.J. tells the court, outside the presence of the jury, I did not, could not, and would not have committed this crime. Despite objections from Marsha Clark, Ito asked O.J. to make a routine waiver of his right to testify. Marsha wanted O.J. to put the waiver in writing to stop him from making an emotional plea that might have been leaked to jurors, through conjugal visits or phone calls or something like that. OJ said in open court, much as I would like to address some of the misrepresentations made about myself and Nicole concerning our life together, I am mindful of the mood and the stamina of this jury. I have confidence, a lot more it seems than Miss Clark has, of their integrity, and that they will find as the record stands now that I did not, could not, and would not have committed this crime. I have four kids, two kids I haven't seen in a year. They ask me every week, Dad, how much longer? I want this trial over. Ron's father, Fred Goldman, said, It's disgusting what he did. It's disgusting that his dream team, scheme team maybe is more accurate, would come here and stand in front of you and tell you it was his right to make a statement to the court. It is disgusting to me that the judge tolerated it. On September 26, Marsha Clark began her closing arguments with a preemptive strike against Mark Furman before taking aim at OJ. She said, It would be a tragedy if, with such overwhelming evidence, you find the defendant not guilty because of the racist attitudes of one officer. She took the jurors through the evening of the murder, showing OJ was unaccounted for between 9.36 p.m. and 10.54, and that he left a trail of evidence from the murder scene to his home. Darden, who argued for a little bit more than an hour, focused on OJ's history of abusing his wife to prove that he had motive to kill her. Darden also brought up Furman telling the jury not to lose focus of the murders of Nicole and Ron Goldman. In closing arguments, Johnny Cochran reiterated to the jury that if the glove does not fit, you must acquit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Darden repeatedly described OJ as a time bomb with a burning fuse, growing increasingly closer to a full explosion. 
Cochran tried to reduce the impact of the accounts of OJ's domestic violence by describing him as imperfect, saying he's not proud of some of the things he did, but these things don't add up to murder. Darden suggested that only OJ could have had motive to kill Nicole and Ron. Cochran suggested that professional killers could have been after Ron Goldman on the night of the killings. Cochran asked the jury why, if OJ was rushing back from a bloody crime scene, was there no blood found on the doorknobs, on the banister, or on the white carpets at OJ Simpson's Rockingham estate? An interesting point. Barry Shett gets up and explains to the jury that the DNA evidence is unreliable. He says that since the evidence was handled and stored improperly, there are enough questions surrounding the evidence for reasonable doubt. Marsha Clark didn't see it that way. She says, I don't have to say anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the people of the state of California, because we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt, far beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant committed these murders, we ask you to find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown. Darden ridiculed OJ's alibi. He said, mockingly, chipping golf balls? There were golf balls in that little black bag? He said, that was the night he was supposedly suffering from acute arthritis. They want you to throw your common sense out the window. Just chuck it out the window. You can't do that. They have one racist cop. On October 2nd, the jury shocked everyone when they reached a verdict after deliberating for less than four hours. Legal analysts predicted that it would take anywhere between two days and two months. Earlier in the day, they had requested to hear again the testimony of Alan Park, the limo driver. It seems that what they were looking at was whether or not OJ actually had time to go commit the murders and then run back home in the short time for which he had no alibi. OJ's home was only about a five-minute drive from Nicole's. Park said that he arrived at OJ Simpson's house at 10.22 p.m. the night of the murders, and he didn't see OJ's Bronco parked outside when he was searching the curb for the street numbers. He testified that at 10.55 p.m., he saw a large shadowy figure of a black person at the front door of Simpson's Rockingham estate. By now, Park had been sounding the intercom for about 15 minutes. Moments later, Simpson answered the intercom and said that he had overslept. The verdict is announced. Not guilty. You could hear Ron Goldman's family sobbing in the background as the verdict was read. And Marsha Clark and Chris Darden look like they're going to cry, too. I'm going to upload a clip of this to BrokenLimelight.com, too. O.J. Simpson was now a free man. He went back to his home at Rockingham, where his family and friends were preparing a party for him. The LAPD had to send police units to his home for crowd control. This must have been infuriating, because O.J. used to be friends with the police, and his legal team just spent the last nearly a year in making complete fools out of their department. They mocked and humiliated them, and they told the entire world that the LAPD was incompetent. And not just incompetent, they were trash. So now OJ's free, and the police have to go to his house to keep him safe while he celebrates. Detective Paul Bishop said, Way back in the beginning, I said to Detective Ron Phillips, Are we going to win this case? And Ron said, If we can't convict this guy, we may as well turn our badges in and go home. After the verdict, I walked up to Ron and said, You're right. We may as well turn in our badges. The next two days, you couldn't get through on the phone lines to personnel because there were so many police and detectives trying to get their paperwork and retire. The ripple effect is going to be unbelievable. All of OJ's friends were at the party, like Al Cowlings and Rob Kardashian. It wasn't long before everybody realized that the rest of the world was not celebrating with them. Polls showed that more than half of the country was outraged by the verdict. OJ's personal agent dropped him as a client and his pay-per-view deal collapsed. The country clubs don't want him back. Everybody thinks he's a murderer. He put up signs on Sunset Boulevard at the entrance of Brentwood that said, Welcome to Brentwood, home of the Brentwood Butcher, and also, Murderer Loose in Brentwood. When the district attorney announced that they were closing the case and no longer looking for the, quote, real killers of Ron and Nicole, OJ was livid. OJ had his son, Jason, read a statement from him saying, that he would make it a priority in his life to find a real killer or killers. Jason looked really awkward, kind of hiding his face like he was embarrassed to be reading those words out loud. I don't think they ever did anything to look for the, quote, real killers. I did see some interviews later where they asked Jason, like, hey, so you said your dad was going to look for the killers. What has he done that you know of? And Jason's like, uh uh-huh. OJ wasn't all in the clear yet. He still had to face the wrongful death suits filed against him by the families of Ron and Nicole. 
In February of 1997, the jury for the civil case found OJ liable and made him pay $33.5 billion in punitive damages. And they took no time to deliberate. But let me explain to you the difference between the criminal trial and the civil trial. So, in criminal law, the parties are the defendant, the person who is being accused of committing the crime, and the state or federal government. So, in this case, the criminal trial against O.J. Simpson, it's like the government, the state of California against O.J. Simpson. So, the government is involved because they have broken a law like murder or theft. It's a law established by the government. So... In civil law, it's more private. It's like disputes between individuals and entities, things like defamation, divorce, negligence. This is a big difference because in the criminal trial, it's like the government is trying to convince O.J. Simpson. And in the civil trial, it's Ron Goldman's parents and Nicole Brown's parents that are suing O.J. Number two is the sanctions or the punishments. This is also different because in criminal cases, when the government is suing you, the punishment can be things like community service or the death penalty. Whereas in a civil trial, the punishment is more often like paying monetary damages or restraining order. This is why like Goldman can't sue OJ Simpson and seek a punishment of death. He can't do that. Only the government can do that. So this is why when OJ was found liable, he had to pay the Goldman's money. Finally, and most importantly, is the way that they look at evidence. Now, in criminal cases, there is the burden of proof, meaning the defendant must be proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt in order to charge him. That means you have to prove it. The prosecution has to prove it. So in OJ's criminal trial, the jury didn't believe that OJ was proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt because they had a lot of doubts surrounding the evidence and the reliability of LAPD. So in their minds, the prosecution didn't prove, they couldn't prove that OJ did it, at least not without a doubt. In a civil trial, they don't have the burden of proof. They have a preponderance of evidence, meaning they just have to lean towards him being guilty more than not guilty. And I literally mean lean. Like, they can't be 50-50, but they can be 49-51. And if their 51 is like, I'm leaning towards he looks guilty, then that's a guilty charge. So that's a huge difference. In the civil trial, there was more than enough evidence for them to consider him liable. And that's probably why it took them no time to deliberate. So in the civil trial, the only punishment possible for OJ was monetary compensation. He was ordered $33.5 million made up of $8.5 million in compensatory damages to the Goldmans and $25 million in punitive damages to be split between the Goldmans and Nicole's children. Kim Goldman said, The dollar amount meant nothing to us. We were just thrilled that 12 people unanimously determined that he was the killer of Ron and Nicole. The rest was just paper. Now, OJ didn't have all the money he was being ordered to pay, and the Goldmans never actually got that money. OJ was supposed to pay them, so the Goldman started seeking all of OJ's assets that they could find. And he was forced to hand over all of his shit, like his golf clubs and his Andy Warhol silk screen of himself. So the city of Los Angeles pulls up to his house, essentially to repossess all of his items, but his friends and his family show up first to clear the place out and make it look like he's living in an empty house and has nothing of value. Some of his really valuable sports memorabilia was put into a storage locker in Northern California. OJ's agent, Mike, he was the one who told OJ to not take his arthritis medication so his hand would swell. He was seen hauling off tons of memorabilia, including OJ's Heisman Trophy. Mike says that he had an arrangement with OJ where, like, he would provide services and then OJ would pay him money for those services. And now that OJ can't, Mike's like, I'm just going to take some of this for myself. So he's actually, like, stealing OJ's memorabilia with the intention of selling it to make his money back. OJ ended up moving out of his home at Rockingham. He says that he chose to leave the house because he no longer had any privacy after the trial and he got a lot of attention. However, he also wasn't paying his property taxes and basically lost the house. The house has since been demolished. The tabloids were offering people a ton of money for footage of OJ, and he and Mark started, like, staging little films that looked candid, like, like they looked like Mike was just happening upon OJ with the camera, but they were actually really completely planned and scripted. By the way, Mike has also revealed something on the documentary OJ Made in America. 
He says that Nicole actually did have an affair with Marcus Allen. According to Mike, about a month before Nicole died, she and OJ tried to reconcile their relationship, but it didn't work out. And OJ allegedly told her, you ever see Marcus again and I'll kill you. It turns out that Nicole had diary entries about Marcus that said she felt beautiful and sexy and smart when she was with him, as opposed to feeling jabs when with OJ. She also writes that she should have thought about Catherine, who was Marcus's wife. In the book, If I Did It, OJ does say that Marcus admitted to the affair. But Marcus still denies it. After Nicole's death, some people had observed OJ screaming at her grave, and uh, they were under the impression that it was because of this. So speaking of the book, If I Did It, OJ lost his book deal. But then the Goldmans were like, this is a good opportunity for us to make the money back. And they read the book and they were like, this is a fucking confession. So the court awarded them the rights to the book. And they renamed the book, If I Did It, Confessions of a Killer. And what they did on the cover of the book is they made the word if really small and they like fit it inside of the word I. So like if you're not looking really closely, it looks like it just says, I did it, Confessions of a Killer. And by the way, I want to clarify something. OJ didn't actually write that book. A ghostwriter wrote the book and then paid OJ to put his name on it. OJ was pretty much like, well, I really need the money and everybody hates me anyway. So he agreed. And this was before the court was like, well, you can't have that money. But they paid him something like $650,000 in advance and he took it. OJ would end up being awarded custody of the kids, Justin and Sydney. Nicole's parents, Lou and Judith Brown, were not okay with this. They tried to get custody of the kids, and they filed an appeal in 1998, which turned into a five-year custody battle. In the end, OJ ended up retaining full custody, and he took the kids and moved to Florida. The kids said that they wanted to live with his dad, so the Browns were, like, kind of heartbroken and, like, kind of nervous about it, because, of course, they think the man is a killer, but they were like, this is what the kids want, and this is what the court it has decided, so they were like, we're just going to try to keep them at arm's length as much as we can. In 2007, OJ caught wind that all of his memorabilia and all his shit was being sold all over the place, and he started hanging out with some shady people in Florida. And when I say shady people, like, these people were admittedly shady. Like, they even said that they were like, if OJ's hanging out with us, we know he's going downhill. OJ was planning a trip to Las Vegas for a wedding, and he told his shady friends, let's rob these memorabilia dealers so that I can get my stuff back Because it also happens that they're going to be in Las Vegas. Also, the day that they're going to go do this happens to be the exact day that If I Did It was released. I can't make this shit up. So, OJ told his friend, Tom Riccio, Look, Tom, this is not memorabilia. These are my personal artifacts that were stolen from me. My football that I was holding in my arm when I rushed for 2,000 yards. The ring from my wife who died that I thought I was going to give to my daughter. Everyone thinks nothing bad happens to me. Here I am being robbed. Why don't we just show the world that I have to go by myself to get my stuff back? Riccio met OJ back at his hotel at the Palms, and they called up another friend, Charlie Ehrlich. OJ asked Charlie to go to the room of the memorabilia dealers and pose as a buyer so that they could see if they really had OJ's stuff. And then OJ called up another friend named Walter Alexander and asked him to join them, and he brought another friend named Michael McClinton. Alexander has been quoted as saying, He wanted to get his stuff back. He was like, hey man, will you watch my back? So I said, yeah. And then after I said yes, he leaned in a little closer and he said, by the way, can you get some heat? Meaning a gun. Alexander said that he hesitated, but then McClinton spoke up and said that he had plenty of heat. McClinton ran a small security company and he had a concealed weapons permit. So he gave Alexander one of his guns. OJ asked McClinton, would you go with me and be my security? McClinton said, sure, I'll go with you. Alexander said, so OJ, you know, what if they call the police? And OJ said, fuck the police. What are they going to do? Take me to jail for taking my own stuff? Now, Charlie apparently didn't know that OJ and these other guys were also planning on coming to the room. He thought he was going alone and just going to pose as a buyer and like look around. But as he's like at the door getting ready to go in, he sees OJ walk up with a big group of guys who all look like they're out of Miami Vice. And Charlie's like, he says that he looked at them, he was like, man, this is such a fucking OJ thing to do. And none of these guys knew each other, but they were all like loyal to OJ. Once they got to the room and they're about to go inside, 
OJ instructed McLean to reveal his gun to the dealers and look menacing. They barged in and the buyers were shocked to see OJ Simpson with a face full of rage. Riccio, the sneaky fuck, turns out that he decided to audio record this whole thing. <laughs> so we have all of this on record. They get in the room and OJ tells the guys to pack up all the stuff and let's get the fuck out of here. So the guys start gathering all kinds of stuff, even stuff that's not OJ's, and they start packing it all up. So even OJ's like taking this random like Joe Montana memorabilia and stuffing it into a pillowcase. So he's clearly not just trying to get his own shit back. He's like actively robbing these guys, probably because he has no money. OJ was heard saying, nobody leaves until I get my stuff. The fact that he says that means that not only is he facing robbery charges, but this is also considered kidnapping. Alexander pulled out his gun for a split second, and then he realized, fuck, this is armed robbery. I'm going to jail, and I'm going to be on the news. So the guys all leave, and the memorabilia dealer goes to the front desk, and he's like, I just got robbed by O.J. Simpson. They literally laughed at him. He calls 911, and the operator is, like, completely annoyed. So O.J. took home all the stolen shit, and then he went to the wedding, and then he got arrested. O.J. was convicted on 12 counts, including armed robbery with a deadly weapon, assault, and kidnapping. The judge, her name was Jackie Glass, gave him the maximum sentence she possibly could, which was 33 years at the Lovelock Correctional Center in Nevada. He would only serve nine of those years. A parole panel granted him parole by unanimous vote in July 2017, and he was released that October. He was still required to abide by conditions of his parole, like he couldn't drink excessively or leave Nevada without written permission. His parole ended early, in February 2022, so for the last year, O.J. Simpson has been living as a free man here in Las Vegas. He lives in the Summerlin area. The Goldman family has been standing by, waiting, knowing that upon release, he'll try to make a living again. Kim Goldman said, I'm not letting up. If I did, then I'm telling him it's okay for what he did. OJ got COVID in 2021, and Fred Goldman said that it was a shame that so many people lost their lives to COVID, and OJ Simpson wasn't one of them. Nicole and Fred Goldman have started a podcast called Media Circus, where they talk about private tragedies in the public eye and how the media gets it right, gets it wrong, and gets in the way. Fred Goldman insists that OJ still owes them $96 million, despite what they've already gotten from them because of interest. And that's where we're going to leave off for part two. So in part three, we're going to look into all the possible theories and take a deeper look at the evidence. I want to really look at the reasons OJ could be the killer and reasons it might not be OJ. And if not OJ, who else could it possibly be? I also want to take a look into what OJ and his attorneys have all had to say since the criminal trial. So I want to reiterate that I'm really back and forth on this case. I like to challenge my opinions a little bit. So I have decided to bring somebody on the podcast who does not think that OJ did it. And this is somebody who I find really wise and I really respect. I want to go ahead and ask all of my listeners, if you have any questions or any theories, if you have any strong theories about why you think maybe OJ was not the killer, do me a favor and send them in because I want to address these things before part three. Don't forget, you can go to brokenlimelight.com to see a transcript of this episode along with some of my sources. I've also included some of the clips that I mentioned, and there's a lot of interesting photos too. You can also contact me on that website, or you can send me an email at ddwest at brokenlimelight.com. If you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel yet, that would really help me out. I'm under DD West. And DD West is also my social media handle on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find our Facebook page under Broken Limelight. Thanks, fam. Talk to you next time. I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight, and I have a guest today. This is Richard Humphrey. He's one of the hosts of the podcast, Development Hill. Richard, thank you for being here with us today. Hi, how's it going? Good, good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your podcast? Yeah, uh, so Development Hell is a like media history podcast. Uh, 
it just sort of goes into movies or books or video games or anything really in the like the just the hard road it uh it takes to get there um we go on a lot of tangents it's really fun though um we do things like peter jackson's king kong uh we just recorded one on two human we just recorded one on the conor mcgregor and khabib like ufc fights and the background drama on those so we've got a lot of interesting stuff so check it out sometime yeah i listened to a couple episodes and it's awesome um it's three of you right and you're are you all comedians yeah so it's me uh kyle anderson uh the guy who also made that crystalia uh documentary oh yeah your listeners probably all watched it right yeah, I think I, I uploaded it on the Broken Limelight Facebook, but if I didn't, I'm going to do it again. It's a documentary about uh, Chris D'Elia and all the allegations against against him about um, like sexual assault, and it's it's fascinating. So yeah, I'm gonna- spoiler alert: that's the tip of the iceberg on a crazy man. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. So that was Kyle Anderson that did that. Yeah, Kyle Anderson did that. Uh, so yeah, it's me, Kyle, and Spike, and we just sort of rotate every week who uh, as the person who takes you through the story of something that was hard to make amazing yeah it's super entertaining thank you all right so like i said um richard is kind of the one who challenged (laughs) my whole beliefs on oj oj simpson and whether or not he committed the murders and that's not to say that he's innocent i it's just there's a lot of doubts honestly i mean it goes to show why it wasn't easy for the jury i think The biggest takeaway anyone can ever have about O.J. Simpson, and probably the correct one is that O.J. Simpson probably did it, but he also might not have. Yeah. And yeah. And I think another takeaway is that um, LAPD didn't just like fumble this case. They kind of ruined the justice system. We We ended up not being able to trust them altogether. So... And it's, I mean, the just, every problem with the justice system, we just put a bandaid over a bullet wound, you know? And so now this justice system is just filled with holes like Swiss cheese. Sure. All right. So this is part three of our coverage of OJ Simpson and the murders of Nicole Brown. First, um, I'm sorry, in the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. I wanted to do one more episode to talk about all of the theories th- surrounding this case and try to better understand if he is definitely the killer or if it could possibly be anybody else. So I want to talk about the theories. We've talked about all the facts, and I want to talk about what people believe in general, if not O.J. Simpson. Because realistically, if we consider the fact that he wasn't criminally charged, it's still an open case. I mean, it's technically cold at that point, right? Absolutely. So why why aren't we looking for the killer? It's that whole thing where I th- sometimes cops feel like they have all the clues that points at one person anyway. So why do the work to prove that it was it couldn't have been anybody else? Why do more paperwork? Yeah, and that's pretty much what happened here. They were like, "We have our guy." And there's like um, a bajillion Law and Order episodes about how that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Another thing that we were talking about, you and I, was that when it's OJ, like, how could he possibly have a fair trial? Like, what what exactly is a jury of your peers at that level? I mean, like, I like to think about it like this. There, rich people live in a world we don't live in in the first place. Like, uh, once you reach the $5 million cap, you become a person in a different level of existence that has different rules, morals. And sort of like ethics in general. And the only time the Venn diagram crosses now is consequence. And that's something that, I mean, is really exploding with what everything happened with the Me Too movement and everything. It's just that's when consequence became well aware and the Venn diagram became real. But before that, all of it really is that like rich people can do things behind closed doors and in front of and with doors wide open and it wouldn't matter because they're rich and that world is different. And that was proven through a lot of the theories on OJ and the stuff that was put through testimony too, of how police handled the fact that they were on an OJ call versus if it was anybody else's, you know, it's uh, like you, you treat famous people different because that's the world they live in. And that's where the possibilities of everybody else that could have done this whole thing live in is the mentality of rich people world, not the mentality of real people world. A hundred percent. You're absolutely right. 
Um, so there are a couple things that I didn't touch on in uh, part one and two, and I was hoping that you and I would bring them up. Um, so one of them, I talked a lot about the racial tensions at the time and how people all of a sudden went easy on OJ. But one thing that I didn't really talk about, um, I didn't even really think about it until I talked to you, Richard, was that the police were also really terrified that everybody was going to riot if they took down another black guy right in front of them. Yeah, it's uh, they were afraid of that. Um, there was, uh, and that's why a lot of the, and I think the defense knew that, like, or like OJ's team knew that too. So they weaponized the idea of, hey, if the media thinks OJ did it and that weaponizes it, we can weaponize the idea of what media is in general, play it to our side because of the way the police would be afraid of anything happening. I agree. And so it, it's it's on all sides at that point, but also when you talk about what the media was doing at the time and with Marsha Clark, they were painting her as a bitch too. Like it was sexist and racist media at the same time, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They were like, they were like feeding off of uh, like tabloid shit. What the, what the audience was going to feed, was going to react to. And I mean, that's probably what the OJ Simpson trial biggest impact on media is, is it, made news admit that we just want the crazy shit. Yeah, we wanted the scandal. Yeah, like, we don't want, like, a lot of the fluff pieces anymore. Like, we want every scandal, and we want them reported, and, like, paparazzis became worse after this. Yeah. And, like, everything became worse after this. Like, we wouldn't have known every detail of a case that should have been private between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard if it wasn't for an OJ trial. Yeah, that's... Really good point. And it's like, I mean, it's compelling that camera footage inside a courtroom is disgustingly boring and the world was gripped watching this shit, you know? Sure. And it's because that's the theater of it all. And the theater of it all is everyone who wanted OJ to go to prison for it felt like they were disappointed in the movie they saw. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they wanted their sports team to win, but then the, like they <laughs> lose at the end, you know, and they're like, oh, damn it. <laughs> and then some people are like that's just life. It's how it happens in a regular courtroom. Yeah. One of the things that I want to talk about was an interview that I saw that OJ did where they asked him all these questions after he was acquitted and he's kind of explaining himself. He was asked how he explains the blood trails from the house at Bundy, to the Bronco, to Rockingham. And one thing that I didn't really clarify before is these blood trails were actually just drops of blood. I mean, it was something like six drops. At, at, like, a, uh, like a nosebleed's worth, right? Exactly. Like that's the, uh, it, it could have been a paper cut, and it's the same amount of blood. It could have been whatever cut was on his hand that he never really yeah. explained. You know what I mean? So realistically, if he had butchered these two people in the way that you see in the crime scene photos he would have been covered in blood there would have been a lot more than just drops in his bronco and that's what he says which is like kind of a valid obvious statement to it you know yeah but, i mean unless he was wearing like a wetsuit yeah he didn't look like mark Wahlberg at the end of the departed shooting <laughs> at damon in the head right. you know like it's <laughs> And they're saying that he left bloody footprints and stuff. You would think that he would have left blood on doorknobs, on his white rug. Uh, you know what I mean? How is it possible all they found were little drops here and there? Yeah, and in rich people world, everybody likes pristine white stuff everywhere. Like, there, there just would have been blood somewhere. Right, and you could say, well, maybe he cleaned it up, but then it's like, well, then why did he just leave a bloody sock at the foot of his bed? You know? Yeah. It, it doesn't really make sense. So that's one point that he makes. Um, when he's asked about the gloves, OJ insists those gloves weren't even his. He explains that he and Nicole bought Christmas gifts for all kinds of people like AC, Marcus Allen, OJ's son, Jason. And Nicole had friends that she bought gloves for too. So the fact that there was a receipt and there was proof that she bought gloves at Bloomingdale's, he's like, they might have not even been mine. Also, like uh, some people don't understand that if you work for a rich person, sometimes you have their credit card and you go out to Bloomingdale's and buy this uh, like glove. That's you know? true. It's like, like at any given moment, 
that's a credit card. It didn't have to be in their hand because these are industrialized people that are also brands and businesses. Like Michael Jordan doesn't sign any receipt. That's true. Um, he also says that like anybody who knows about buying good gloves would have bought similar gloves. They were just nice gloves. Yeah, at the so, time, like, like that was the glove, right? Yeah, the he was saying there's probably, a yeah. t- according to him, that doesn't mean anything. You could have probably walked down the street and found another classy guy wearing the same gloves. The next is the size 12 Bruno Mogli shoe prints. So OJ has asked what size shoe he wears, and he says, well, if you look at my closet, you'll find anywhere between a 10 and a half and a 13, but they focused on size 12. So he's asked, have you ever owned Bruno Mogli? Bruno Magli shoes and he explains that he can't even tell you what the name of the shoes he's currently wearing are. He has nearly 40 pairs of shoes and he has no idea what they're called. But he does say, I would never buy those ugly ass shoes. <laughs> so I one I mean I trust when a man says he would not buy an ugly ass pair well, of shoes cuz he probably thinks they're ugly first off. Two, most famous people have that situation where it's like there was years where Nelly didn't wear the same pair of shoes every day. Like he had someone come and give him new pairs of Nikes to wear. Sometimes you don't know the shoes you're wearing. Yeah, you're right. And like now when you think about it, all they had was that he wore a size 12 and like he wore a size 12 among other sizes. Like that's not, doesn't really point also, to much. Also famous people parties, you get a big, at like the Oscars just happened. They had these like quarter of a million dollar gift bags that had a bunch of crap in it, you know? And it's like, you could have got those shoes from some big event. And then you had no idea. Yeah, you're probably right. It would almost be suspicious if he did know exactly what pair of shoes it was. Yeah, that would that would be giving too much. Like a liar always gives too much. Yeah, that you're that's what they always say. Okay, so then they asked him, who did Alan Park see walking on your driveway last night? Or that night? Alan Park was the limo driver who uh, he had said that he was waiting outside for OJ. OJ didn't answer the intercom. And then all of a sudden he saw a figure that looked like a tall black person in the driveway. So they asked him, who was it that Alan Park saw? And OJ essentially says, Park didn't say he saw someone walking on the driveway. Marsha Clark took his words and redirected them. What he actually said was that he saw someone standing by the front door. I did step outside the front door for a moment and went back in. So then they asked him, why did you lie and say that you had been sleeping when you answered the door? And his answer basically is, I think Park answered as honestly as he believed he could, but I never said I was sleeping. Cato Kaitlin actually said at some point about OJ, he must have overslept. So OJ says, I think that that stuck with Park and he repeated that I had overslept, but I didn't actually say I was sleeping. Hey, and also sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I just need to go grab like a couple breaths of fresh air and then come back in. That's common people shit. Yeah. I mean, it's a hard, it's hard to argue. Like, (laughs) we don't know. We can't say whether he was sleeping or not. That's the, that's the whole thing is it's OJ probably did it, but he might not have. Yeah. He might've been sleeping the whole time. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, I mean, people take Ambien and then have no idea what they did during it. You know, it's. That's true. Okay, so then they asked him about his relationship with Nicole, and OJ said that he's proud of it. He's asked about the domestic violence, and he pretty much denies all of it, which kind of surprised me. Nicole's sister, Denise, had testified to OJ's abuse of Nicole, and OJ in this interview says, Denise is like family, but I don't think Nicole would be happy with the things that she said. He also said, Nicole didn't take crap from anyone. She was not a wallflower. If I was out of line, people would have seen. She would not take it. And that's not the image that Denise has been promoting about her. He also says that Denise has betrayed Nicole and the perception of her and that he had seen Nicole cry about Denise more than he's ever seen her cry about anything. So I don't know if I believe anything he says about that, but that's his. I mean, I think it's I think it's toxic to be airing that shit out anyways about anybody, you know, and it's just proof that like they were in a toxic relationship in the first place. And that's the biggest whole lightning rod to the OJ did it thing is this whole thing was toxic. Yeah. And any toxic relationship either ends with you split up or you end up dying somehow, you know, like it's you either die in it or you escape. Yeah. It's sad, but you're right. And like, if he did abuse Nicole like that, that's not evidence that he killed her necessarily. And no one's ever saying he didn't abuse her. Yeah. 
And it's like the, it's the one thing it's like, no one ever took that victim experience away from her. No one ever said that never happened. Yeah. Both things can be true. Yeah. Okay. I agree with you. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's weird for a, for a man to come on a podcast and be like, you know, abuse, but (laughs) (laughs) no, but I mean, that's another reason I wanted to have you on here. You've always been, um, kind of an advocate for victims and, um, I knew you weren't going to come on here and be disrespectful. So, but yeah, like OJ might be garbage, but does it make him a killer? We don't know. Will we ever? And, know? And we, could we know? We'll probably never know. Yeah, I don't think we could ever. And that's that's the sad that's the sadness of it, you know. Is and that's like the part of us that that's the human part of us that always needs to know something. You know, it's like it's why every conspiracy gets built out around everything or anything. Honestly, it's because we want to know every little piece. It's why we can't let the October 1st shooting like rest because we can't ever logically say, what if he was just crazy? And because he never left, he never left a note. Mm -hmm. It'll always be, he was just a crazy man, but it's like, it's hard to accept because of what happened. Totally. And that's, and that's every, and that's, that's our human mind that that's our curious George part of us. Yeah. But with OJ, you want to believe that somebody's going to serve time for that you know you do and it's like you hope someone does eventually but it just might not happen yeah it's it's tough i don't think it ever will i mean it's been 30 years and nobody's looking into it yeah it's except us right now (laughs) right (laughs) (laughs) all right so i'm continuing on with the with the abuse he talks about the 911 call from 1989 and he says i was wrong He explains that he locked Nicole out of his room and she got a key and went inside and then he physically removed her. He explains, I left some bruises. I'm a big guy. If I punch someone, they're going to swell up and you're going to know it. She put up a struggle. He says that in that phone call, there was nothing physically actually happening. So the the interviewer says to him, but she sounds so scared. And OJ says, yes, but she didn't sound scared 10 minutes ago when she was yelling at me. He says that there's another tape that the prosecution didn't want everybody to hear. And in it, Nicole admits that the door he kicked in, supposedly kicked in, was already broken. So, again, I think that OJ, little by little, kind of admits to the abuse and just doesn't think it's abuse. And maybe that's that's systematically something that, like, men through the past 30 years have also been addressing in themselves as we all try to grow, you know? And it's like... He was probably bred in a system where in his mind, that was kind of how you handle things. And he's not in a place where those people went to therapy either. Mm -hmm. And it sucks, but like, he's talking like a man who's grown up in normalized domestic violence. Yeah. And that is a, so it's a symptom of a bigger issue. It doesn't change what he's done. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so there are some interesting points that I found about this that I just wanted to bring up. Um, Earlier, I had mentioned that Ron Goldman had marks on his hands that could have been from him flailing about and hitting tree branches. But I had read some other accounts that said that they were actually bruises on his hands with like cuts over them, indicating that he might have punched his assailant. Now, OJ did not have those injuries. It's hard to understand what that means. Been different accounts said different things, but um, I don't know. I found that interesting. I mean, that seems like evidence that cops looked at and went, I mean, we can take or leave that because we already have our guy. Yeah. Like, uh, that, that, like it was probably just ignored because they were like, we already got OJ. Do we, do we need extra stuff to get OJ? We're fine. This, this case is airtight. And then they go to the criminal case and it's not airtight. Yeah, you're right. Um, Okay, so I want to talk about some of the theories. One is somebody named Charlie. So in the book, If I Did It, which, like I said, OJ didn't write the book. He just kind of allowed them to attach his name to it. But in the book- They gave him a check and he said, okay. Right. What's weird about the book, though, is that he did an interview afterwards. And it's like about the book. They're asking him about the book. And it's so bizarre watching him do this interview because they ask him about- the chapter where he actually murders them and he's like and they're like well how'd you do this and he's like well what i remember i I, I mean uh (laughs) it's the weirdest thing yeah it will there's also that 
when you go on these talking tours for like books, you're given points to talk about or contractually there's things that interviewers can say about what's in the memoir and what they can't say. Like when Jeanette McCurdy's book came out, there was only certain excerpts that everyone was reading from. The rest of it had to be purchased from the book. And so it's like, that could just be a guy not remembering his talking points. Yeah, you're probably right. So in the book, he describes an accomplice who was a friend named Charlie. And from what everybody can gather, there's no like real Charlie. or Nobody knows uh, anybody named Charlie surrounding him. But in the book, this character named Charlie ac accompanied him to go scare the shit out of Nicole. Supposedly, like, Charlie came and told OJ, hey, Nicole's partying with some other guys. Let's go over to her house. And they both went to her house together. Then OJ claims that he woke up covered in blood with no recollection of what happened. Again, this is just a story that he attached his name to. Yeah, from a book that uh, he probably never wrote. I mean, that, that ghostwriting stuff just happens. Mm -hmm. And probably when he signed on for the book, it probably wasn't titled that either. I don't think it was, but I can't remember what it was called. You know, like like Penguin Publishing probably come up, it came up in there like, this is the OJ book. And he wrote a book throughout all of this, but I, I think it didn't blow up because nobody wanted to read it because it was like in the middle of his trial. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to look into it either. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to read those words. Come on now. It's going to come off like a manifesto. Do I think OJ is well educated enough to write a book like that? No. Right. So there are a lot of theories, but I don't think a lot of them hold very much weight. One of them is that Nicole's friend Faye Resnick got in trouble with some drug dealers like owed the money and they came to Nicole's house to like scare Faye and Nicole got caught in the middle of it i don't see much evidence in that faye resnick kind of like she wrote a book that was like supposed to be a story about nicole but it was so like you know about this book don't you she wrote about like um a romantic experience between her and nicole it's yeah called drama yeah and it's like it, it's that thing of there's always these weird creepy tendrils in hollywood of people that have met a famous person once and like they're gonna nail a book deal with something that's fake exactly and then like frauds get found out at the end of every day, you know, like it's. Yeah. So there's a reason most people haven't read that book. Exactly. So they're supposed to be like best friends. But yeah, it totally it totally seems like Faye just attached herself to the story as much as she could and got a book deal out of it. Yeah. The next theory, which I think is probably the biggest theory, is that the killer was actually OJ's oldest son, Jason. Remember, Jason was his oldest son from his first marriage. So by the time OJ got with Nicole, Jason was about 15 years old. Yeah, he was. And so Nicole was his stepmom. Exactly. Yeah. And she was how old? I mean, she was 19 when he came into her life. So like they, they, they were peers. Married. Yeah. And they were both probably... Uh, have a connection of being abused by the same person and so they can get close you know that's an interesting point because so, the the bigger theory is that they had a very close relationship and mm -hmm. what's more close than trauma bonding at that point yeah while actively both going through it so one thing i think about jason is this is the one theory that i kind of entertain because if OJ is not the killer, I feel like OJ knows exactly who the killer is and he knows what happened because to me, he, he never asked what happened to Nicole. He never really tried to find the real killers. I think if he didn't do it himself, he knows who did it. And Jason's the only person I can think of that he would cover for. Yeah. And that is rich people world logic of shit. My son killed somebody. I'll help cover it up. You know? Mm -hmm. This theory comes from a guy named Bill Deere. He's an investigator and he wrote a book called OJ Simpson is Innocent and I Can Prove It. I wonder what that book's about. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> so he explains how as Jason got older, he and Nicole would start hanging out and going to clubs together because they were so similar in age and they became close. They would hang out and bond. Now, on the night of the murders, apparently... 
Jason invited Nicole to dinner at a restaurant where he was working as a sous chef. So as a sous chef, if you're inviting your family over to cook for them at the restaurant, that's kind of a big deal. And like everybody in the restaurant's kind yeah. of excited to like serve your family and stuff. And it turns out that she bailed. She ended up not showing up and she went to Mesa Luna instead. Now, on another note, Nicole had apparently told a few people that she had seen someone outside of her window stalking her in the bushes. Initially, she thought it was OJ, but upon second glance, she believed it might have been Jason. So people have reason to believe that Jason might have been obsessed with Nicole, too. Now, Jason was never looked into for this. He supposedly had an alibi for that night because he was at the restaurant serving dinner for like 200 people. What Bill Deere discovered was that the restaurant actually closed early that night. There, there was no 200 people. And mm. his, um, his time card at work, they had like a digital time clock. But for some reason, he didn't actually clock out. He hand wrote his time out. And then they discovered that there was nothing wrong with the time clock. He could have digitally clocked out. So it would seem like for some reason he was trying to put like falsify what time he actually clocked out. So what actually happened was he wasn't serving dinner. His girlfriend picked him up and drove him to his apartment. And according to Bill Deere, there is a gap in time where he could have gone and committed the murders before going back to his apartment. And I mean, uh, I watched a little bit of the Bill, uh, Bill Deere. There's a whole documentary on it. It's like an hour and a half. It's on. A, it's all on YouTube if you guys want to watch it. Um, he puts his resume up as like pretty credible private investigator on this stuff. You know, it's not like he's just a guy. Because hmm. like, he, because uh, he was like, I don't have uh, the power to arrest people or do any of that stuff. I'm just a private investigator, and like, I mean, it's it's more than the people who find the guy who fucked with cats in that one documentary, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, for sure. That was just like you and me. Yeah. That's just like, that's L us figuring it out, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, literally Vegas, you know? And, and it's... So, um, there's a couple of points that he makes in this. Um, one was that Jason was actually in the military and he was trained in hand, co hand to hand combat. Another one was that Jason was taking a medication called Depakote, which is used for epilepsy, but it can also be prescribed to manage manic symptoms like bipolar mania. I mean, like in the military, like there's some PTSD probably there too, you know, like it's it's, right. the military is not nice around that time <laughs> or now it's, it's. Yeah, he left the military and came home to OJ. Yeah. It's, I, <laughs> <laughs> so. It seems that Jason did suffer from seizures as well as bouts of rage. And he had actually checked himself into like mental health clinics a couple of times to deal with his, his rage. Now, none of these things are really evidence. <laughs> it, it, it's strong character evidence towards somebody. It means nothing, though, at the same time, you know? Exactly. It shows a guy with an anger issue who did more to try to fix it than his father was. Sounds like a guy that was willing to try to break a cycle. Like, I, I don't hear any of OJ's, like, attempts to go to anger management therapy or check himself in like that, you know? No, you're right. Okay, so I listened to this podcast called Real Crime Profile, and it was really interesting because the hosts of them were, like, a couple of them were former FBI profilers. One of them was, like, the cast like the casting manager on criminal minds like it was really interesting so like oh like the consultant for to make sure like accurately yeah, exactly does, yeah one of them had like worked in scotland yard and stuff like it was really interesting and they had an interesting theory so their theory is that there were multiple killers and it possibly was jason and oj so that, there'd have to be a lot more premeditation to the murder with that theory. And it's less of a crime of passion at that point. Like if yes they're both no. doing it. Yes and no. Because they're speculating that maybe one of them premeditated it and the other one stumbled upon it and helped the other out. Or Jason committed the murder and OJ came and cleaned it up. So, Which, what are you going to do for your son? <laughs> and to that point, not just did he want to protect his son, but... In this podcast, they described that OJ might have actually felt like he failed his son 
Uh, for one, if he was actually still with Marguerite when he started dating Nicole, Jason could see it as if Nicole tore that family apart or OJ let it fall apart. Also, when Jason was like eight years old, his baby sister died when she fell into the pool. As it turns out, Jason was put in charge of watching the baby when that happened. So that could carry a lot of trauma. Yeah, like there's heavy PTSD probably with this kid. I mean, do I think maybe he had a weird anger issue and his dad said, you're going to the military? Probably because that's what happened back then. You're absolutely right. You know, and it's like. And then he figured out ways he could try to fix it and get away from it because he was in the military away from his dad for a while. Then he gets back into this system of abuse and it becomes toxic again. So um, this former profiler, he says that he, that he's a friend of Henry Lee, who was one of the criminologists in this case. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, uh, he's like uh, William Bear's big uh, thing, too. Yeah, right? About, like, he, yeah, he quotes him a lot in the documentary. Oh, his face is right here on my yeah, YouTube. Yeah, because it seems that Henry Lee had a lot of things to say that they never really listened to him about. And as a result, we never really heard about. Yeah, it's like, we don't need to hear from this guy. We have our guy. We don't need any more evidence. You know, it's right. it's over and over again. I feel like it was just detectives saying that until the trial came along and their whole integrity was challenged. Exactly. So according to Jim, he was a friend of Lee's and Lee told him that he believed there was more than one offender. But when he brought this up to the prosecution, they brushed it away and said, we already have our guy. And they literally just were not interested in hearing anything more. And these are out of Henry Lee's mouth. He says that there are signs that there were actually two assailants. One is the shoe prints. He appears that the shoe prints showed that there were two sets of shoe prints. The other is the fact that there was two people, so it just makes more sense that two people overpower two people than, than one person overpowering two people. Finally, according to Lee, Ron had holes in his pants where he had been stabbed in the legs, and according to Lee, the holes line up in a way that show that both of his legs were kicking simultaneously as he was being stabbed, indicating that somebody was lifting Ron up while he was being stabbed. So he believes that one asylum, as that one assailant was holding him from behind and lifting him off the ground while somebody was standing in front of him, stabbing him. Mm, what a terrible way to go. So if OJ did do this with somebody else, it would have had to be somebody that he completely trusted. And like, like really who else it could, you could speculate AC Cowlings, which I think it would be weird if he went and did this Bronco case, like Bronco chase after killing Nicole. And like <laughs> if they went and did it together and then they got into Bronco together. I don't, yeah. I don't see that as very likely. Bottom line is that they never really looked into Jason and he ultimately didn't have an, an alibi and they never did look at his DNA or compare it at all. I, I remember uh, when I first found out about the whole Jason stuff, uh, I like jokingly posted on Facebook, uh, OJ, what if OJ didn't do it, guys? And someone was like, he didn't. And then another person was like, he didn't. And I was like, what do you, what y'all mean? <laughs> And so I, I, so I looked into it and I was like, oh, Jason. Okay. And then I like turned to my mom. I went, I went downstairs. I was like, hey, mom, you just thought OJ did it, didn't you? She's like, yeah, he did. And I was like, what about Jason? And she goes, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> like, and my mom like religiously followed the case and had no idea. That's how much that whole information was hidden. Yeah. Nobody ever talked about it. And out of sight, out of mind, you know? Yeah, dude. Did you entertain any of the stuff on Glenn Rogers? Oh, I was going to talk about it. So there is a theory that uh, a serial killer did it. Yeah, he confessed to doing it to his brother. Mm -hmm. And then his brother went and told the cops, yeah, my brother said he killed Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, that OJ hired him to do it. And, th and this guy kept saying that in jail. And, and then like, actually it, knew Nicole at some po point in life. Like they had actually hung out. They had hung out and like their, his like modus operandi and like the other four people that this actual serial killer has killed fit the way he killed people. <laughs> and do you remember what his motive would have been? 
he said OJ sort of uh, that OJ like paid him to like kind of rough them up and scare them, but that you might have to kill the bitch is, was the quote that he said OJ gave him. Damn. To rough her up and that if there was a weird fight that you might have to kill somebody. Mm. And it's like that. I mean, it was years later, so nobody wanted to ever care, you know? One of the things that I believe I read about him was that he had admitted to a lot of murders and then recanted yeah, he, some. It, yeah, like he uh, uh, that he was in connection with like all these other ones, but there's like that one. The timeline fits for he was there, really. <laughs> like in the same, like uh, apparently that was the one thing is that like he was in that area at the time, so it could have happened. But uh, people want, and then there's like what a couple of movies and documentaries have been made about that, uh, like the 2019 film, the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson purports to tell the story as asserted by Rogers and his family about his involvement with Nicole Brown Simpson. Rogers is pra- uh, portrayed by Nick Stahl, who, uh, was in the third Terminator as John Connor and Mina Suvari playing Nicole Brown Simpson. Huh? 2019. Damn. That sounds interesting. I got to look into it. But yeah, I think that's why a lot of people don't believe him is because he's recanted some stuff. But I mean, you're right. If he was there at that time, like we can't, we can't really rule him out. That if nobody's fucking looking into him, we're taking his DNA evidence or anything. Dude. I mean, and they're making full movies about the whole story. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they're not making Jason movies. I mean, they're making Friday the 13th <laughs> Jason movies. They're not making Jason Simpson movies. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, and that's another thing about Jason is I believe he had, like, not just rage problems. I believe he might have, like, abused ex-girlfriends before or, like, blown up on ex-girlfriends. I mean, I hate to be the guy that says, like, I'm not surprised, but, like, we know his father's a known abuser. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he was probably abused, and it's all that same cycle, man. Yeah, you're probably right. All right. uh, Do you have any other theories? No, that's the major one that I was like, really, it's like, I mean, it probably like, that's the thing. Glenn Rogers admitting to it, but also like tailing onto other Mm -hmm. murders is shitty. But like, I mean, that means he has as much of a possibility of doing it as OJ does in the eyes of the law. Yeah, really, they should at least look into somebody else if they're going to accept that OJ didn't do it. Yeah. And I don't know. It's like, I'm too white to talk about the racial bias and that kind of thing, you know? (laughs) Okay. So before we finish this up, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about Ronald Goldman. Um, He kind of gets forgotten about in this. And I don't know if you've seen um, the show, American crime story, the people versus OJ Simpson. Did you happen to watch it? Oh yeah. Uh, I'm a, I hate watch every Ryan Murphy. thing. You do. I love Ryan Murphy. (laughs) Yeah. I I don't know. It's like I I've, I've watched everything he's produced and I don't know. It's like I end up like I, I didn't. What's that one with Ben Platt where he's like trying to run for president of school? He has no all idea. these Netflix like really crappy things and it's just ugh. <laughs> more of a Ryan Murphy guy. <laughs> anyway, um, the people versus or Brad Falchuk, I mean, what? I meant Brad Falchuk, his writing partner. Way better guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I lo- Yeah, I love Brad Falchuk, too. But, um, yeah. So the People versus O.J. Simpson is really good. Cuba Gooden Jr. plays O.J. And yeah. uh, Rob Kardashian is played by David Schwimmer. And then Selma Hayek is... Or not Selma Hayek. Selma Blair, my bad. Is, Selma uh, Blair is a Chris um, Jenner. Yeah. Is Chris Jenner. Yeah, it's it's a it's good. Like, yeah. I mean, it's the better of the American like uh, crime stories. And again, it went back to making courtroom footage interesting. Yeah, it absolutely. Yeah, you're right. They did a great job with that. Yeah. Um, anyway, so in that show, the character of Fred Goldman, that's Ron Goldman's father. He says in the show how in this whole scheme of things, his son just kind of became a footnote. And it's really sad because he was really this like vibrant, caring being who would have gone and protected anybody who would have gone and saved anybody. And he just kind of got really forgotten about in this. So I just wanted to take a minute yeah, to it, say some things about him. What did you say? I was saying, yeah, it does suck. Like uh, Ron Goldman, like for all, like no one has ever said like, oh, there's Ron, there's skeletons in the Ron Goldman closet. No, you know, you're right. 
it's uh, it, it's like it, like everyone's like been like, oh, there's there's stuff in the Nicole Brown Simpson closet, but it's Ron Goldman was just a guy, and I don't know, I don't think anyone deserves to die in like a horrible manner, but it's like especially just a guy. He really was. He was just wrong place, wrong time. It sucks. And like with all the speculation about whether or not he and Nicole were romantically involved, it's not like that has anything to do. Like it's not like that would make him deserve the murder anymore you know no and it's like oj sleeping around with other people like Mm. if nicole is sleeping around with other people like that's probably one like neither of our business but like not they're doing the same thing it's not like one person is worse for anything at this point for sure and for all we know he really was just getting off his shift at work and stopping to drop off her glasses and he got murdered yeah you know, and, and that sucks. Mm-hmm. So Ronald Lyle Goldman was born in a Chicago suburb on July 2nd, 1968. When he was five years old and his sister was three, their mom left them and they were raised by their father, Fred. Now, a couple of years later, when they were about four and seven years old, their mom kind of kidnapped them, took them back and told them, your father doesn't want you anymore. And then their father, Fred, had to like go into this whole custody battle to get them back. He won, fortunately, and then their mom just fell off the planet, never talked to them again. As kids, they were in a horrible car accident. I believe he was 16 and his sister Kim was about 13. So they were in this horrible car accident where Kim almost died. She ended up almost losing her sight. While she was trapped in this car, Ron was screaming, save my sister, save my sister. And eventually he was the one who pulled her out of the car. And then while she was in the hospital recovering, He held her hand the entire time and cracked jokes while she recovered. As a teenager, Ron spent summers as a camp counselor and played Little League Baseball. He worked as a recruiter, tennis coach, and waiter, and he had big plans to open his own restaurant and bar. So by all accounts, he really just was a nice guy who looked out for other people and had plans of his own. And that's pretty much it. I mean, bottom line, like we said, this is still an open, unsolved case. OJ was acquitted. Nobody ever went to jail for it. And nobody's looking for the killer. And and there's no statute that, of limitations it, either. So if they wanted to, they could look into them. They could. Now. Jason's still alive. And isn't Glenn Rogers too? Yeah. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I think Glenn Rogers might Here, I have his... Uh, yeah, he's 60. His birthday is July 15th. What a good, uh, what a good birthday gift we could have if we could... Uh, get him for this murder it's also known as the cross-country killer and the casanova killer come on now guys yeah he's already already sentenced to death he's appealed it a bunch of times Hmm. yeah so that's pretty much it um if i left anything out it's only because this was so fucking much to research you guys (laughs) you have no idea so um but these are some of my sources the book raging heart by sheila weller the book the run of his life by jeffrey tubin a few podcasts you're wrong about last podcast on the left true crime obsessed and real crime profile um and then like i said i discovered that oj was living like right here in my neighborhood literally like three miles away from me and like I put, yeah he go we've all shopped at the same I costco as oj I simpson on Facebook, like you guys know that he's still in vegas and everybody was like yeah i saw him at the smoke shop i saw him at the bar i see him all the time i was like what the fuck like he i looked it up he lives like literally three miles from me he um was uh when he like first like moved to Vegas, he was just like drinking at the Cosmo and people like came up and he was like signing autographs and stuff and being really nice about it cuz he was like kind of focused on just like I'm just going to drink. Well, at I'm the sure bar he doesn't want to rage like, out you know, now. Yeah, exactly. But they kicked him out of the casino stating that he was like causing a huge scene and he like sued them saying that they just kicked him out cuz he's OJ. Oh my god. Yeah, one of my friends said that they saw him at a bar and he bought everybody around and some people were like really irked by it. Like they didn't want to take his drinks. Honestly, there are, I mean, you got OJ Simpson and John Wayne Bobbitt running around Vegas. John Wayne Bobbitt? You know, the guy got his, uh, yeah. Jeez, I'm so behind. And (laughs) so who do you want to get your, who do you want to buy you a drink, guys? (laughs) Oh my god! They Come on! Like, I don't want to be the next little blonde girl they get mad at. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. 
All right. Well, that's everything. Um, thank you so much, Richard, for being here again, guys. Don't forget to check out his podcast development. Hell, um, is there anything else you want to say? Um, no, I mean, like you covered it. Yeah. Please check out development hell wherever podcasts are available. Uh, there's two other podcasts called development hell that we're currently in a fake war with. <laughs> um, so make sure you go to the right one with the devil face on it and you'll be good. For sure. All right. So, um, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and tag you guys too. I'll, I'll try to link it in the show notes. And if worst case is worse, um, go to brokenlimelight.com and I'll put like a really easy to find link on there. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. All right, I'll talk to you later, bud. Don't forget to check out brokenlimelight.com for a transcript of this episode, along with videos, pictures, and links to all my sources. You can find Broken Limelight on Facebook or find me, Dee West, on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube. If you have any questions or suggestions for future cases, feel free to reach out to me at dee West at brokenlimelight.com. Until next time, bye.